Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the RAS specialist discussion meeting on 3D structure of the FLIA chromosphere. Uh, thank you for attending. It is really great to see um, all of you here. This is the full program of our meeting. I just posted it into the chat box so you can have easy access. We have two sessions. Uh, morning session and afternoon session. I'll be chairing the morning session and uh, Lindsay and Hugh will be chairing the afternoon session. Um, just before the lunch break, we have poster session. We are each participant will have three minutes to discuss about their posters. Uh, and uh, during the lunch time, we are going to use WonderMe platform for virtual networking and poster viewing. Uh, Linsday will provide some instructions later how you can use this WonderMe platform. It's very easy and straightforward, uh, but uh, uh, please stay with us during the lunchtime if you can. So for questions, we are going to use, uh, in the main program, we are going to use Q&A facility in Zoom. Uh, so, uh, the chair will uh, read out your questions, but uh, you can uh, you can ask your questions by raising your hand, and chair will unmute you to speak. So to help the discussion, please keep the Q and A for questions and uh, make any comments you have in the chat. We also have that uh, Slack channel for discussions, and we can also use this. Uh, during the meeting. Okay, so uh, this morning we have five speakers and um, uh, first speaker is Mihalis Masiudakis from Queen's University Belfast and Mihalis is going to tell us about the diagnostic potential of asymmetric FLIA line profiles. Mihalis, please start when you can. Well, good morning everyone. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Uh, well, I'd like to thank very much the organizers for giving me the opportunity to um, give this uh, talk today, uh, which is going to focus on the diagnostic potential of uh, asymmetric player line profiles. So there is a, a tight program. Sorry, Mihalis, can you unmute? Oh, I'm sorry, I had not realized that I was muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, sorry, it was my fault. I, I pressed mute all and I thought when, when I'm pressing mute all, the panelists are not muted, but anyway, sorry about that. Yeah, you okay. can carry on now. Uh, so my first, um, uh, as I said, my first uh, encounter with asymmetric line profiles was when I was still a PhD student back in the early 1990s. And I was observing at the South African Astronomical Observatory doing some spectroscopic flare monitoring. Uh, and uh, I got this uh, flare on the DME star called AT microscopy. And it was a rather peculiar flare in the sense that there was not a massive increase in the lines, in the line fluxes. These are the calcium H and K and uh, H delta lines, but all the higher boundary lines could also be seen. Well, most of the higher boundary lines could also be seen. But what was uh, peculiar about this event was that there was a very large blue asymmetry that was very uh, prominent in, in all the lines um, that uh, uh, we uh, observed. And uh, that, that blue asymmetry indicated velocities as high as 500 kilometers per second. So we uh, thought that that was a case of extreme chromospheric evaporation, uh, uh, but looking at some more recent papers, including one that appeared in Nature Astronomy yesterday, um, it might have been a a signature of a stellar eruption, perhaps short of a CME because the velocity is not as uh, high as the escape velocity for the object. Uh, but again, that was my first uh, encounter of asymmetric flare profiles. However, today I'm not going to talk about this very large line asymmetries. I'm going to talk about much more uh, smaller uh, velocities and much more subtle uh, asymmetries. Uh, and I will start off with uh, this player event that was studied as part of the F Chroma uh, project, uh, a very successful project, I must say, which delivered not just 
a lot of new science, but also models, archive to the community, um, the training of early career researchers, and also a significant amount of outreach. So in this M1.1 player uh, that was captured by um, AIA and by the observer at the Swedish Solar Telescope, which was using the crisp imaging spectropolarimeter at that time in two spectral lines, H-alpha and calcium, I will focus in this tiny part, the red box, which is one of the flare kernels, and describe what we saw in the H-alpha line profiles. Uh, so um, here we have on the top part, the two um, sets of H-alpha line profiles. One set on the left-hand side before flare maximum, and on the right-hand side after flare maximum. Uh, the dashed line profile that you see here is the quiescent pre-flare uh, profile of, the, of an average uh, quiet sun atmosphere, which as we know is in absorption in H-alpha. But as the flare progresses, um, we can see that the profile slowly gets into emission with uh, the wings coming into emission first and so faster, but also the core coming into emission, but the core maintains this sort of self self-absorption. Uh, what is interesting to see is that before the flare, um, the, um, the core is blue shifted towards uh, the blue. Um, it's not so evident in this very broad line profile, but it's perhaps a little bit more evident in the Radin simulation, which is uh, below. The core is shifted towards the blue, and that makes the uh, red peak to become a lot more apparent. After flare maximum, we see the kind of reverse effect. The core, um, the absorption core is shifted towards um, the red, and that makes the uh, blue peak become stronger and more apparent. And again, that's replicated quite well in the right in simulations that we see below. Uh, when we dug a little bit uh, deeper to try and understand what was uh, happening, what was going on here, we looked into the uh, contribution functions, which are always a very useful tool uh, to, to understand um, the, the formation of a, of a spectral line. The contribution function effectively tells us at what part of the atmosphere different parts of the line profile uh, get formed. Uh, so in the uh, two bottom panels here, you will see the, the, the darker, the, 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 the uh, shade here, the gray shade, the, the, the darker the area, the more the contribution function, the higher the contribution. So on the left-hand side here, uh, you see the uh, black line, which is the H-alpha line profile. And uh, on the vertical axis, we see the height in the atmosphere. So the line core, um, which is in, in uh, this sort of self-reversal line core, is formed very high in the atmosphere where the line wings are formed uh, deeper down. The line core also suffers the highest uh, level of opacity. And uh, this can be seen by this red line, which is the tau, the tau equal to one layer. So again, the line core has a higher opacity. The wings uh, um, are much, yeah, somewhat uh, more uh, um, optically, in the, the, there are less optically thick than, than the core. Uh, the blue line, uh, the blue dashed line, dash line shows the velocity profile um, from the Radin simulations. So what you can basically see is that at a height of around 1.1 megameters, uh, we have the velocity profile, uh, which is shifted towards uh, the blue, and that makes the line core to shift towards the blue. So effectively, we have uh, an evaporation effect. Um, but because the line core is shifted towards the blue, the wavelength of maximum opacity is shifted towards the blue, which makes the blue peak to be suppressed and the red peak much more uh, apparent. So a blue shift is actually creating a red excess. The reverse effect occurs um, later on in the simulation when we have um, uh, the compression uh, so we have a small downflow, which again shifts the uh, wavelength of maximum opacity towards the red, making the blue peak more apparent. So a, 
a blue excess does not necessarily mean a blue shift. In actually, in this case, a blue excess means a red shift. Um, this effect is not was not just seen by, by ourselves. Uh, it has also been seen in other studies. Uh, one, a more recent one was on the passion alpha during a flare using the Hydro 2 gen con, uh, con, uh, code by um, Malcolm Druin and Valentina Zarkova, where they see a very sort of similar sort of asymmetry in passion alpha. And because it's an opacity effect, it's kind of a little bit more universal. It's also been seen in the calcium H line of bright grains by Carlson and Stein, um, and then potentially also in some spot umbral flashes in a paper by Vasco Henriquez and collaborators. Um, I should point out that this sort of line asymmetries in flares has been seen uh, uh, seen for many years. It might be worth looking at a paper by uh, Peter Heinzel, which uses data from the multi-channel flare spectrometer at Andreo Observatory, where uh, you can see again these asymmetries in H alpha and a review paper by Arek uh, uh, Berlicki. The, in the second part of my talk, um, I would like to speak um, uh, about the uh, effect of um, flares on, on the astrophysical potential effect of flares on the so-called astrophysical noise um, that relates to um, uh, exoplanet discovery. So just to set things in, in context, uh, we know that one of the most popular methods, uh, widely used method and very successful one for detecting exoplanets relies on the radial velocity variations that the planet uh, induces on the host star. And this is best seen in photospheric lines because there are very narrow lines and there are much more easier to see those radial velocity shifts. The problem is that the signal that an Earth type exoplanet or an Earth size exoplanet is going to induce on, a, on the host star is, is minute. It's of the order of centimeters per second, uh, tens of centimeters per second. And that signal is obscured by the radial velocity um, um, variations that the star itself is going to produce. And those radial velocity variations can be anything from uh, sunspot induced asymmetries on the line profiles, flare induced fl flare heating events uh, on and their effect on the line profiles down to plage regions, um, uh, convective uh, blue shift granulation itself. And the best way to highlight the, the the, the difficulty in trying to uncover that very small radio velocity signal is if we look at our own sun and the radio velocity signal that the Earth induces on it. So the Earth will induce this red uh, sort of oscillatory, semi oscillatory radio velocity signal, which is uh, of the order of tens of centimeters per second, but that this is hidden into the noise that the sun itself. Um, introduces due to the various magnetic features and non-magnetic features on its surface, which is of the order of uh, hundreds uh, of, of meters per second. So this motivated um, us to dig into a little bit, a little bit further into this problem. And we looked into the a paper by uh, a poster paper that Steven Saar and collaborators presented at the Cool Star Workshop in Boston in 2018. So what Steven Saar and collaborators did was they looked at um, AIA uh, 1700 um, imaging data to identify potential heating events, impulsive events, uh, by means of, of looking at bright pixels. And then they looked at those uh, same locations using, using HMI, effectively uh, the studying the radio velocity uh, shifts that the iron one line in HMI shows at those locations. They did that not just for flares, but also for flash regions and network elements. What they found was that flares were generally a lot more red shifted when they were seen uh, on disk, at disk center, uh, at a new around about one close to disk center. And those red shifts that the velocities in iron one was of the order of uh, 100 to 200 
uh, meters, meters per second. So they argued that we see the more red shifted at this center because the atmosphere feels the punch from the flare. Uh, and they seem to be more uh, blue shifted uh, towards, towards the limb, although the scatter here is a lot uh, more. So with Aaron Monsoon, who is a PhD here at Queens, and he's going to give a, a talk later on today, we decided to look at another spectral line, uh, the Iron 16301, uh, and used one of the F-chroma models to study uh, the effects of radial velocity variations on this line as a, reduce, as a result of, of flare heating. So the black line profile here is the quiescent, uh, pre-flare line profile. And when the beam is injected, uh, we see how the absorption profile fills in to, oh, and the one which is the, the biggest, sees the mid -biz, biggest effect is the one at around 13 seconds into the heating. Now, if we take the difference between the one at 13 seconds and the black line profile, we have uh, the quiescent line profile. We have the net, if you like, emission during that is due to, to the uh, uh, flare, uh, which is the black profile on the right-hand side. Now, what we see is that that net emission is blue shifted by a very small amount. Uh, well, small by, by comparison with the, the, the large kilometers per second variation that we see. Uh, it's, that it's, it's blue shifted by about 500 meters per second. So it's not red shifted, it's blue shifted. So then we looked into the cause of this uh, blue shift. And again, the contribution functions of the line uh, come to uh, be a, a great help. So on the left-hand side, we have the contribution function of the line from the pre-flare atmosphere, where the black line uh, is the, the temperature minimum uh, uh, of layer, the, the top of the, temp the temperature minimum, the, the top of the photosphere effectively. And below are the corresponding line profiles. So because the line is primarily formed, well, the vast majority of the, of the line it comes from the, from the photosphere before the flare, we can see that the total line profile, which is the black line, is almost the same as the photospheric contribution, which is the blue line. The chromospheric contribution is almost non-existent. However, during the uh, period of uh, uh, 13 seconds into the, the heating, we can see that now the, the chromosphere begins to contribute. And this, this dashed line also shows the velocity profile that has been um, induced into the, 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 the chromosphere, into the atmosphere. Now, if we go back now and we disentangle the contribution, the photospheric and the chromospheric contributions, we see again the Black line is the total um, line profile, which is made up of a, a photospheric contribution, which is the blue line profile, which is slightly shifted towards the blue. And now a more significant chromospheric contribution, which is a lot more shifted towards the blue, because we have that kink, kink here in the, in the velocity that uh, uh, is responsible for that. Uh, by sector analysis can help us look into this into a little bit uh, more. And uh, again, we have the pre-flare line profiles, the one at 13 seconds into the heating and then one at 25 seconds into the heating. So in pre-flare, we have the rest velocities. Um, at uh, 13 seconds into the heating, we have the uh, chromospheric contribution, which is blue shifted up to about 400 uh, meters per second. The photospheric contribution, which is less blue shifted, but then the bisector of the total line profile will indicate a red shift. So that red shift is not really real. And Hong et al. in 2018 uh, also spotted that, and they just call it a fake red shift without providing too much information as to what was creating. And they call it a fake red shift because the radon simulations were not uh, showing it. The next topic that I would like to, the final topic that I would like to talk about is about magnetic field um, variations and magnet, potential magnetic field transients during the flares. 
Uh, I want to show this slide, which is from the work that piece of work that uh, Dato Kuritz and, and uh, several other collaborators did uh, on um, a flare with the with the SSD, where we created this nice map of it's actually not a flare, an ongoing flare, it's a it's post-flare loops. A very nice map of the magnetic field in these post-flare loops, which shows how chromospheric diagnostics from ground-based facilities can actually allow us to study the magnetic field up to coronal heights. And these magnetic fields are strong, um, have several hundred of Gauss per second, and they seem to be living for prolonged periods, for as long as 30 minutes or longer. But I want to talk a little bit about the magnetic transit and the potential variations in the magnetic field that we may be able to see or not be able to see. And the Hong et al. paper used the radius simulations to introduce a magnetic field into the, the, the atmosphere uh, for both a quiet sun uh, uh, profile and a penumbra starting uh, atmosphere, starting atmospheric profile. Now the penumbra profile shows um, it's much broader uh, because the magnetic field at the bottom of the model is a thousand gauss, so you begin to see the Zeeman splitting in this line profile. And then they let magnetic field to drop as a function of height. So on the right hand side, then they reproduce the corresponding Stokes V profiles, which um, are one of the diagnostics that we use to infer the magnetic field. So what they see was that as the line fills in with that chromospheric emission that I mentioned earlier on, uh, the amplitude of the stock v, Stokes V profile seems to be uh, reduced. And a reduced amplitude will indicate a lower magnetic field, but the magnetic field is not actually changing. So I guess the reason that there is this reduced amplitude is because we have an increased amount of a chromospheric contribution where the magnetic field is lower anyway because they let it drop as a function of height. Excuse me, that's 20 minutes, Mary. Thank you, thank you, Hugh. So the, uh, they argue that those magnetic field transits may be due to flare artifacts. Um, and this is something that I want to uh, emphasize again because we looked at this also not just in a flare setting but in a magnetic field oscillation setting using inversions in a paper with Chris Nelson uh, recently, where we saw these oscillations in the magnetic field. But when the magnetic field appears to oscillate, the density that comes out from, from the inversions, which is this red line at the bottom, is pretty much constant. If you fix the magnetic field, and that's the blue line here, then the density begins to show variations. So there is this constant interplay with opacity effects that we have to be aware of. And my final slide, uh, which presents also my con the concluding remarks, is that I think that Fabry-Perot interferometers um, really present um, a, a gold mine for flare studies because we can get millions of lines profiles at every location uh, or, or, or on, on the flare ribbon with a cadence of about a second or even less. And you can see these various line profiles uh, from the boxes on this X9.3 flare that we captured from the SSD. I think flare observations and simulations, the stuff that we are doing is highly relevant for exoplanet studies, especially as that area moves towards biosignatures so that we can see the effect of uh, the flare energy on, on the atmosphere on specific molecules. And finally, I think if we want to be have more uh, reliable studies of magnetic field transients and variations during flares, we should utilize simultaneous observations of many spectral lines with different land DG factors, including some which are not sensitive to the magnetic field because that these lines will give us the thermodynamic properties of the plasma. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mihalis. Time for maybe one quick question. I, I can't see the questions, so maybe you can. Yeah, there is nothing in Q&A box, um, but I have a question, Mihalis. Um, 
So we know that these type of asymmetries are observed in stellar flares and most stellar models also shows this. You mentioned this at the beginning of your talk. But my question is, do we need, because the flares are local phenomenon, do we need very strong flares to, uh, to detect this type of asymmetries in, uh, in stellar flares? or it could be detected in moderate size uh, uh, flares. You mean the asymmetries, the small asymmetries in the line profile, the meter per second asymmetries, or these large asymmetries? That one. Uh, yeah, small and yeah, large and small asymmetries, yeah, maybe I, both. I, I, think, I think the large asymmetries can be seen, and this example was actually one, not one of the biggest flares that this object has produced. There was only about a factor of, Three or four increase in the in the actual uh, line flux, but there was a big blue shift. When we talk about the small uh, uh, asymmetries, these ones uh, here that we looked at with uh, Aaron, I think we have to see them in the context of the of the radial velocity jitter, because even if you have a beam, it, it very much I guess depend, depends on the beam and how deep in the atmosphere is going to, to penetrate. If the spectral index is low and the lower energy cutoff is high, it's likely to the deep beam is likely to dig to dig deeper into the photosphere. But even if it produces meter per second variations in photospheric lines, it does mess up any detection of exoplanets because uh, the signal that is going to be uh, produced there is in the centimeter per second, uh, is in, in, the, in the tens of centimeter per second area. Okay, thank you. I think Peter Hensel has a question. Um, just, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, ju just a comment. I think, uh, Michal, is this example of large blue shift in Balmer lines it indicates uh, rather the presence of CME. We have another example for another star <clears throat> of the same effect in Balmer lines. And uh, we are now working on that. And we try to make some radiative transfer simulations of uh, CME effect on, on that star. In fact, such large blue shifts in Balmer lines, I think they have never been observed in, in solar flares. We have, of course, a large blue shifts in hot lines, evaporation, but we have only, only very small shifts, which uh, people call gentle evaporation in H alpha line, but this is uh, not so, so large. So I think, uh, I think if we extrapolate our solar knowledge to stellar flares or CMEs, I would, uh, I would think this is rather CME th th than the flare. I, I agree with you, Peter. The only thing is that we have to remember that the escape velocity from these objects uh, is higher than from the sun because there are much more compact objects. So 500 kilometers per second may not quite do it, but the velocity might be higher than that. But our temporal resolution may have averaged them and brought them down a little bit. So I agree with you, yes. Yeah, this is line of sight velocity. So due to projection effects, you can have larger velocity actually. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Okay, thank you very much again, Michalis. And uh, we need to move now to our next talk. Um, and our next speaker is Chris Osborne. And uh, he's going to talk about modeling of the radiative effects of FLIA energy on adjacent chromosphere. How is that? Um... Is that okay? Yes. Okay, lovely. Um, right, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you about some uh, 2D simulations of the plasma surrounding flares that I did during my PhD. So the, the focus of these simulations really is to perform a sort of first order investigation on what effects just the radiation of a flare can have on adjacent chromospheric plasma. Um, so um, why, why are we particularly interested in that? Well, I mean, I think it's probably quite evident to the people here, but um, we, 
our solar telescopes are always increasing in resolution and we're seeing a lot more sort of horizontal surface detail now. And this is especially true for ground-based optical um, observations um, with telescopes such as the Swedish Solar Telescope. Um, here we've got a lovely observation from the new Solar Telescope at BBSO and of course Deakist is coming. Um, and what we're seeing is that there is a lot of really detailed fine structure in chromospheric flare ribbons and a large number of sort of compact flare kernels. Here we're looking at an observation of post flare ribbons and these are tiny. Um, they're just their extent is tiny and that will likely correlate to a lot of very small um, compact heated flare regions. Um, so uh, of, of the order of sort of just a few hundred kilometers. And next to these in the chromosphere, given that the heating is predominantly believed to be traveling down the magnetic field, um, this heating is going to be quite localized. And then next to them, there's going to be quite a gradient in the plasma parameters where this plasma has likely not been excited to the same extent. And OK, so um, the radiation doesn't care really about the magnetic field that can go pretty much um, directly horizontally in these regions. So what effect is that going to have? Um, and how can we diagnose this? Is it important for our observations or is it just an effect where it all sort of gets swallowed up by the surrounding plasma within tens of meters? Um, so th that was basically the idea of, of, of what we set out to model here. So I'll briefly just discuss um, radiation hydrodynamic modeling. Um, so I'm sure you're all familiar. Our current sort of set of um, radiation hydrodynamic models, such as Radin, Flarix, and Hydrad, they're great. They've given us lots of insight into how flares evolve. Um, and uh, but all of them take a sort of a plane parallel field aligned single flux tube description of a flare, uh, because that's what you can do within the radiation hydrodynamic um, concept. Um, However, it's quite a jump to go from that to the sort of more complex, uh, to the exceedingly complex 3D system sort of that we're seeing here, um, particularly when it comes to diagnosing the intensity structure that's going to be happening in the, in the chromosphere. Uh, so, okay, um, let's look at sort of how we built our model. Okay, so our model is to simulate uh, a two-dimensional slab of, of plasma, so effectively 3D, but uniform along the into the page axis. Um, and on one side of it, we just put a, we put a radin flare model uh, that is injecting its angularly dependent radiation into the slab. The slab is two megameters wide and about 10 megameters tall, um, just based on the, on the radin model. Um, and it starts off with the same starting atmosphere as Radon. We, uh, the, and then we hold its temperature fixed, its density structure fixed, and the velocity structure is, all, well, the velocity is also held at zero. So the slab isn't responding to anything, it's constant, although we do allow the electron density to vary with charge conservation um, as the populations within, within the slab change. Um, it's obviously important that the boundary conditions, so here the Radin one and on this far side, the quiet sun boundary condition, um, are angularly dependent. Well, this is important for the flare one um, because of obviously we have significant flows in flares and other things that can create asymmetries. Um, and the radiation field is not is is not nice and isotropic in flares. So we we take into account that effect. It turns out that we can actually use this simulation in a, or we, we can use the way we've modeled the problem there in a slightly more complex way um, and produce an observation of what would be observed by um, a theoretical slit spectrograph looking across the flare. So if the flare is this central box here, um, and then, and that previous setup was effectively this half of it, we can reflect that in the z-axis. And the radiation that would be coming along this blue ray here from the reflected atmosphere is actually just the same as the radiation from this magenta ray in the simulated atmosphere. So we can actually use this to build up a bigger, um, 
a, a bigger picture of what would be observed than simply what we are simulating, uh, which is nice because these are being fully time dependent models. These are already um, quite <laughs> computationally intensive uh, simulations to produce. Um, we choose specifically not to uh, set our instrument directly vertically above the model. Uh, th this is due to the fact that that case is already it, it is, is too academic. We're never going to observe anything without inclination, and inclination will obviously affect the results here. Um, we picked a ray with the mu of 0.95 um, and when projected into the XZ plane, which is effectively what we're looking at here, you've got an inclination to the vertical of uh, 2.24 degrees. Um, th this is enough to see some effects, but also I did to see some effects of inclination, but not have them not have them dominate the problem. And most of the effects we're seeing are from population changes due to the radiation entering. So the results we present will be effectively what is viewed by this theoretical slit spectrograph um, viewing with this angle. So let's have a look at some of those results now. Um, oh. Yeah, very quickly. Yeah, okay. So we used two different radon simulations. We used um, uh, they were, had the same parameters other than the beam rate, uh, which was uh, ten to the nine ogs uh, per square centimeter per second in the less energetic one, and ten to the ten in the more energetic one. These beams uh, deposited constant energy for ten seconds um, with a spectral index of five and an energy cutoff of twenty keV. Um, they were kind of intended to be relatively average flare simulations. Um, and then add fully time dependent two dimensional slab is run for um, every internal time step of RADIM so that the populations are correctly treated in a time dependent fashion. So given that we're discussing optical things, um, our primary lines of interest here are going to be H alpha and calcium 2 H542. Um, so here, what we've got are some of the observations that our theoretical slit spectrograph would see at several different um, time steps for the less impulsive model um, for H alpha and 8542. The red line here indicates the location of the flare. The positive X region is effectively the looking into the flare that we had um, on that in this picture. So the, this is the positive X region. And then the negative X region is this. Um, so immediately we see effects going a long way into the slab in H alpha, well, well over a megameter. Um, these effects are present in both the positive and negative direction. In 8542, it's less pronounced for this amount of heating, although effects do easily go up to a megameter in positive X. And certainly for the first of three quarters of a megameter, they're quite visible in negative X, although this is not a particularly good way to see the magnitude of the effects on 8542. Um, they are, it, it, there is a significant shallowing of the line core that is present here um, that varies significantly with time. And of course, um, here we're seeing, uh, well, around here, there is actually quite a lot of asymmetry in the H alpha lines that form, despite the fact that the plasma in the slab is held completely constant. So this asymmetry is arising just from the asymmetric radiation, asymmetric and anisotropic radiation that's being injected from the, from the flare, um, since the populations themselves aren't moving. So we can look at the same thing for the um, more energetic uh, flare boundary condition, and we see, um, well, the H alpha pattern is, is quite complex. Previously, we had just this sort of narrowing going on here, followed by that broadening. And now in some of these, we're seeing really quite complex patterns that take time to develop throughout the model. Um, and, and they do evolve. And this is in part linked with the time it takes for the electron density to, to be modified by the flare's radiation field to stabilize and then evolve back to a new equilibrium once the, once the flare starts to calm down. Um, and for um, 8542, we're seeing significant broadenings of the line going relatively deep into the uh, in, into the slab itself uh, and the light the line core get um, depth reduces significantly out to about one megameter in the negative direction so um, I'm going to play you the video that was on the title slide again uh, th there's a link to it here 
if you if you want to look at it yourself so that zoom doesn't just sort of crush it a bit but what we can see is that these effects are very very dynamic and by the end of the simulation the, it, it does start to settle back down towards um the the sort of quiet sun initial conditions which is what's given at the top and bottom of each of these um but there is an extended period of effects going on out sort of over uh, this distance and those are actually due to um the changes in the in the populations so here are the populations uh oh, it, here are some relatively complex plots that I'll gloss over um, to some extent. Uh, these show in the first column the contribution function for the lines in the first column of our 2D slab next to the flare. So that, so just darker tells us where these lines are forming. And then in the next two columns, we've got the relative change of populations for the upper and lower levels, respectively, of the line forming populations. So this is for H alpha and this is for calcium 28542. Um, the most interesting feature, I think, is these uh, these decreases in the line forming populations for eighty five forty two. Um, not just yes, that's 12, 12 minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, not just the extent of this decrease, but also um, how uh, the, the the shape of it and the shape of this de decrease does depend significantly on how anisotropic the radiation going in is. Um, because so so the uh, these decreases are directly connected to photoionization of of calcium two, um, which is why it's happening to basically all of the calcium two populations, and we see an increase in calcium three um, here. Um, but this complex shape is due to the anisotropy of the flare radiation, and that affects how deep in the slab this is able to to penetrate. But also some regions just remain relatively unaffected, just due to how the plasma in this sort of flaring boundary condition evolves. Um, how so? How it, how much it's flowing, but also where it is at each point, which is obviously connected to the flow. But being a time dependent thing, it's just, it's sort of the integration of both of these two effects. Um, I wanted to show you an observational comparison with the same observation as Mihalis just had, but I think we're going to have to skip over that. Um, but well, okay, what we've done is we basically positioned the slit spectrograph, the a theoretical slit spectrograph along this region. Um, and we can compute time series of what this is observing um, like this for different wavelengths. Uh, this was for 8542. Uh, and this blue line here shows an enhancement of 40% over the background, which is just taken to be this far edge of the slit, which is taken to be relatively quiet. Um, and so we can look at that. The flare peak here is at 1709, so it places it about here. And for 8542, uh, so this is the difference between those enhancements in the line core minus the wing enhancements. And we see that they're about the same. They're about they're both about zero at, at flare peak, um, and and then they drop off very rapidly. And this somewhat matches what we see uh, in our model, although of course the timescales are very different. Okay, um, time, time to wrap up. Yep, I am. <laughs> yeah, so um, what we see is some um, enhancements um, deep, going deep into these slabs visible over one megameter from the flare. Um, these are very visible with our telescopes um, and are quite wavelength dependent, which matters if you're starting to consider things like filling factors. Um, there are some quality agreements with uh, observations, but it's not, there's no, yet again, there's no easy way to compare these things other than it shows that these radi radiative effects are important and something that needs to be considered in our next generation observations. Okay, sort of time up. Uh, questions in the Q&A, I think. I think ah. questions should go into the Q&A. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I've got one um, from Malcolm. Um, no, I think you shouldn't answer them. I think we should proceed to the next speaker. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, sorry, Chris, but please uh, try to go to Q&A and see mm -hmm. the Malcolm's question. Yep. So our next speaker is um, Sean McLaughlin, and Sean is going to talk about the radiative hydrodynamic model of the Lyman continuum during solar flares. Hey, uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes, yeah, yep. Great. 
Hi, I'm Sean McLaughlin, and I'd like to welcome you to my presentation on the rate of hydrodynamic modeling of the Lyman continuum during solar flares. So the Lyman continuum is the free bound transition of a free electron to the ground state of an ambient hydrogen nuclei. There's a recombination edge at 911.12 angstroms. And the quiet sun, the Lyman continuum is believed to form at the top of the chromosphere base of the transition region and is a non-LT, non-local thermodynamic equilibrium. The Lyman continuum can be used to determine the plasma conditions in the chromosphere, so it can be done using this approximation here, known as the Edin-Barber approximation, which says that the intensity is equal to the Planck function, a function of the wavelength, and color temperature, where the color temperature is the temperature at which a black body emits radiation the same wavelength as a given object. And this is divided by the departure coefficient of the ground state of hydrogen. So the ground state of hydrogen population divided by the ground state of hydrogen population and LT where LT is the assumption that you're in thermo or local thermodynamic equilibrium. So your plasma is very slow enough in space and time that you can assume it to be in thermodynamic equilibrium. And if B1 goes to one, you're in LT and TC is approximately equal to electron temperature of the plasma. Eve on board uh, the Solar Dynamics Observatory is currently the only mission providing solar Lyman continuum observations. So here's an example plot. You've got irradiance versus wavelength and it's from Shadow Mulligan's MOSE 2018. You have your pre-flare spectra and then your impulsive phase spectra, and you can see it's greatly enhanced during the solar flare. And you've almost got uh, two gradients. So you've got a shallower gradient near the head of the continuum and a steeper gradient uh, towards lower wavelengths. And this was hypothesized by Machado and Noyes in 1978 as potentially being evidence for an optically thin component of the Lyman continuum, which forms during solar flares. But I'll talk more about that later. So to investigate uh, the Lyman continuum, I've been using the f chroma greater radon models, where Radon is a 1D rated of hydrodynamic code, meaning it solves the equations of radiative transfer and hydrodynamics simultaneously for the six level or for the population conservation of the six level um, hydrogen atom, nine level helium atom, six level calcium two ion, and can include a six level magnesium two ion. However, it's not included in the f chroma grid. And it has an adaptive mesh grid of which 1D atmosphere. So if you look at this plot here, you've got height log of temperature and log of density. You've got your photosphere, temperature minimum region, uh, chromosphere, transition region, and corona. So it weights its points to typically resolve velocity and temperature features uh, in this transition region. And over the years, radon has been modified to look at the uh, injection from non-thermal particle beams, primarily uh, electron beams. And I've been using the F-chroma grid, which is 72 models, which have been generated as part of the F-chroma project. And these were generated for a range of generic electron beam parameters. And uh, so these parameters are the electron flux density. And these are just the values which I've been using in my analysis. The low energy cutoff, uh, again, the values I've been using. And this controls where your thermal and non thermal component of electron spectrum meet. And then the spectral index, which controls the uh, non thermal electron power law distribution. So uh, threes, a uh, harder beam, and sevens, a, a softer beam. So initially, we wanted to look at what does the actual Lyman continuous spectra from Radon look like. So in this plot here, I'm showing the log of intensity versus wavelength for the 311, or 3, 310, sorry, 20 kV model, 111, 20 kV model, and 311, 20 kV model, varying the spectral index with the pre-flare value shown here. This is the pre-flare spectra. And then the T equals 10 seconds spectra, which is the uh, peak of the beam heat in Radon for the delta three to seven beams in steps of one. And then these bottom three panels, again, it's the 3E10, 1E11, and 311 models. However, the uh, spectral index is fixed now at five, and I'm varying the low energy cutoff. So from these plots, we can see that the low energy cutoff and the spectral index doesn't have much of an, an effect on the uh, Lyman continuum intensities, whereas it's strongly dependent upon the flux of the non-thermal electron beam. So as you increase the uh, fluxes across these panels, you typically get about uh, half an order of magnitude increase in the Lyman continuum intensity. You'll also note that there's a few issues in these uh, plots. So you'll see there's a couple of data points missing here and here in the calcium 2 continuum, and in this case, the Lyman continuum, and uh, also here in the calcium 2 edges missing. This is due to numerical noise, which seems to be coming in from uh, solving the equations of radiative transfer. And currently, it's uh, been investigated that if we change this scheme, would it still have this effect of the numerical noise? But for the sake of this analysis, we've just ignored uh, any models where the Lyman continuum is directly affected. We can then apply our Edin-Barber approximation and get estimates of B1 and TC. 
So that's what I'm, I'm doing here. So I've applied the Edin Barber approximation between 515.9 to 911.3 angstroms. The top panel again is your uh, 3, 10, 20 kV models varying the spectral index. So you've got the log of A1 on the y axis as a function of time, and then your 1A11 and 3A11 models. And then the bottom three panels is just showing the log of the color temperature for the same spectral indexes, and then 3, 10, 1, 11, and 3, 11 models. So generally, we see B1 decreases from 10 to the 2 or 10 to the 3 to about unity. And the color temperature generally increases from 10 to 3.9 to 10 to 4.2 or 4.3, which is in agreement with observations. However, there's clearly these times where you have large spikes in B1 and TC. So if you actually look at the spectra at these times, there appears to be a flattening towards the head of the continuum. And then the Edin Barber approximation no longer holds because you can't fit the spectra with a black body uh, function. So to understand what's actually occurring here, I'm showing this plot, which shows the log of N1, your ground state level populations of hydrogen as a function of height for the 3E10 delta 3 20 kV model and a comparison of the 3E10 delta 5 20 kV model. So I'm just showing these two because the delta 3 beam you can see is the spikes uh, more spread out, whereas for the delta 5 beam, it's quite steep. So uh, the colored lines then represent the N1 values at these time steps. So uh, in steps of one seconds from three to eight seconds. And then these dashed horizontal lines uh, indicate where the optically thick layer of the Wyoming continuum is at those times. So you can see at about three seconds before the uh, beams really taken off in the heating, you can see that the uh, chromosphere has large N1 values and the corona has low N1 values as you expect. Then your beam heating begins to take off, your N1 values decrease, and the optically thick layer uh, begins to shift down deeper into the uh, chromosphere. However, there's this small region, which is uh, more visible from the delta-5 beam, which has still a large N1 value. So this is a region of plasma, which is between the beam heating and the transition region, which doesn't get heated as much by the beam heating. And as a result, you still have a large N1 value. This can then absorb the photons, which are coming from the optically thick component, causes, causes that flattening in the spectra and gives you these large B1 and TC values. And an extreme case of this actually causes a light curve dimming for uh, one of the models, but I'm not showing it today just for time constraints. So then we want to see, well, where does the Lyman continuum actually form in the atmosphere? So I'm using contribution functions, and I should point out that uh, Durant and Sarkova 2019 also have Lyman continuum uh, contribution functions in their uh, paper. So this is showing the contribution function for the 311 delta 7 20 kV model. So you have the log of the contribution function shown here in grayscale, plotted as a function of wavelength and height. Then you have the log of temperature over plotted in red as a function of height for the 1D atmosphere. And then you have the tau equals one layer over plotted in blue where the crosses are indicating the uh, wavelength sample in, in red. And then this goes from uh, 0 seconds, 8 seconds, 10, 14, 18, and 20 seconds. So you can see at t equals 0 seconds, the uh, optically thick component forms at the base of the transition region, as we expect from observations. Your beam heating kicks in, and your optically thick component shifts deeper into the uh, chromosphere. And you also have these two optically thin components which are formed due to chromospheric uh, evaporation. So if you remember from the previous slide, you have that uh, small region that's not really being heated. So in some cases, this can turn into a solar bubble. So you're, uh, this is a region of plasma which isn't getting heated as much, it gets trapped between two hotter pieces of plasma and then travels up along the evaporation front. So you can see it's traveling up here along the, uh, towards the corona. And then at 14 seconds, you can see the smaller third optically thin component. This is formed due to chromospheric condensation. So this balances the evaporation front. It's a denser region of plasma, which travels down slowly towards the uh, chromosphere, deeper into the chromosphere. And at 18 seconds, this merges with the optically thick component. And then at 20 seconds, your beam heat turns off. And for this model, just the uh, bubble actually increases in N1 value, and this causes a large jump in the, 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 the tau equals one layer. But the key points really are that the optically thick component shifts deeper down, and then you have these optically thin components formed due, due to evaporation and condensation. 
However, the number of these uh, fronts depend or optically thin layers depends on the type of evaporation you have. So if you have a gentler evaporation, then you can have only one evaporate. You can just have the evaporation front and no condensation front. And this causes you to only get one optically thin component, whereas this is a case for explosive evaporation. Then lastly, I just want to show the beam heating for the same model. So the beam heating is shown by this red scale, plotted as a function of time and height. And then there's these blue contours, which show the 75, 50, and 25% values of the uh, contribution function divided by the peak contribution function at that time. So you can see you've got your optically thick component forming up here. Then the beam heating kicks in. It starts to form much deeper in the atmosphere, close to the peak beam heating region. And then you've oh, got 12, 12 minutes. If, yeah. yeah, I'm just wrapping up now. I'm going straight to the conclusions. And then you've got these uh, three uh, optically thin components, which continue to interact with the beam because they're denser regions of plasma. So just to summarize, in the quiet sun, uh, the lime continues optically thick and a non-LT forms at the base of the transition region. During solar flares, it forms much deeper down near the peak beam heating region and is approximately an LTE. Because it's approximately L an LTE, TC is approximately equal to the electron temperature. And the optically thin components of the uh, Lyman continuum form due to chromospheric evaporation and condensation. And because they're denser regions of plasma, they continue to interact with the uh, beam heating. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sean. Any questions for Sean? Yes, Petr. Just a comment. You mentioned uh, EVE observations, but currently uh, we will be able also to detect the Lyman continuum by SPICE spectrograph on Solar Orbiter. All right. Thanks. Thanks for uh, uh, that. I didn't know that. OK. Thanks again. Um, now we have Petr Hensel, and Petr is going to tell us about off-limb observations and analysis of cool FLIR loops. So I will briefly speak about off-limb observations uh, and some analysis of cool FLIR loops, which we did uh, recently with my collaborators. Uh, Key problems in analyzing the, the, the flare loops, uh, it was uh, previously called post flare loops, but we prefer to say flare loops, yes, cool or hot, whatever. So uh, the key problems are to study the loop evolution in time, uh, cooling, uh, possible heating, time scales. Then I will focus mainly on plasma densities, which is the key problem, of course, for, for everything in, in flare loops. And, but we also detected uh, large uh, turbulence, uh, so-called micro turbulence during flares uh, in the loops, which is also interesting topic, but I am not uh, going to speak about it here. And Mihaly has already shown the magnetic field measurements in a large flare loop system uh, recently detected. So I will speak, in fact, about the same flare loop system as Mihalis has shown for the magnetic field. This was uh, nicely observed off limb on September 10, 2017. Uh, there was a large flare uh, detected uh, uh, right uh, at the limb. And here uh, you can see uh, SDO images. Uh, the, the, the left one is from HMI. So this is uh, visibility of these uh, flare loops in white light. And uh, the color images are uh, shown in different channels of AIA. I will come back to these uh, nice observations later. For HMI observations, uh, uh, Lucia Klein, she made this nice movie. So you can see evolution of the white light loops where the top of the loops is very bright. The top kernel is very bright. Yes. And we use this uh, to analyze the, the, the radiation, the white light radiation in top of, of these loops. Here you can see comparison with Gauss evolution. So this is basically 
post-maximum evolution. And here you see the same as was shown in the movie. So we made cut here on these four examples, different four times. Uh, you see the, the, the dotted red line shows the cut through the, through the loop in the height. And here is the, the intensity profile, which is calibrated to absolute energetic units. We use uh, calibration for that. So in this table for different times, you can see how the intensity evolves. So uh, the maximum intensity was 24,000 in CGS units per, per angstrom. And we use these uh, calibrated intensities uh, to compare with uh, calculation of the, of the continuum intensity. So for that, we considered uh, different processes. Here you can see the simulations and uh, the, the possible processes are the, the recombination continua, which is passion continuum, bracket continuum at the wavelength of HMI line, and then free free continuum, and possibly Thomson scattering on free electrons. So if you have rather low electron density, this is 10 to 11. So for 10 to 11, uh, you see that uh, Thomson scattering uh, is uh, rather important. This is well known for prominences, for example, there is Thomson scattering is dominant in, in prominences of limb. While the, the, the recombination continua here are less important and free free is also not very important. But if you go to higher densities, 10 to 12, and then especially even higher, 10 to 13, you see that the, the Thomson, Thomson scattering continuum is rather low, negligible here, for example. And at low temperatures, free free is also uh, very small. Free free is increasing with the temperature. So for, for hot loops, uh, free free can be important. But we see here at lower temperatures, which are supposed to be at, at, the, at the top kernel of the loop at lower temperatures. We know that from other diagnostics, uh, which will be discussed later by Julius Koza. So at these lower temperatures of the order of 10 to four, the dominant mechanism is, is passion continuum at this HMI wavelength with some small contribution from, from bracket. Uh, it is interesting to know that uh, although the, the Thomson scattering continuum is very low compared to what is producing uh, the, 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 the emission of HMI channel, then this, uh, this uh, component can be detected uh, in, in, uh, as a polarization. So even if it is weak, the polarization is there and uh, there is possible possibility to use these polarization measurements from HMI as a diagnostics of the electron density in these flare loops. There is a work by Saint Hilaire and, and company in, in preparation on this. So we made the maps, uh, we made the maps of these uh, loops uh, for different conditions. And uh, I don't have so much time to discuss in detail. You can look at the paper by, by H. H. Klein and myself. So for, because of course we have to assume some temperature of the, of the loop top and also some line of sight uh, thickness, but uh, the robust result is that the densities, electron densities in these uh, uh, bright loops are relatively high of the order of 10 to 12 or even, even more, which is an interesting result. Here is another example here how we uh, how we can look at the densities because here we make 2d plots of of uh, temperature and effective thickness uh, along the along the loop and uh, this can give us some estimate of the electron density uh, interesting point is that uh, these loops have been also observed from ground by the swedish solar tower sst uh, and uh, Again, uh, it was a nice observation, which was done by, by, by David, Kurize and company. And they use these observations to derive magnetic fields. And uh, 
and uh, Julius Koza together with David and me, we did some uh, non-LTE modeling and analysis of, uh, of uh, cooler lines in this loop. So Julius will speak about it later. Uh, but it's also interesting that in some channels on SST, we can also see this white light emission in the loops, similarly to, to HMI. So for example, here you can see above the limb, nice signature of white light emission. And here, Julius Koza provided me with this slide. Uh, here, this is in reversed uh, colors. So this is actually the emission, this is the limb, this is the, the chromosphere. So you see the same feature here. This is the broadband, wideband continuum channel on SST chromis at this wavelength. But if you go to narrow band continuum uh, on chromis, uh, in fact, you see no signature of white light. This is natural because in, in narrow band, you can hardly see at least see the white light continuum due to atmospheric effects and, and other things. But what is very interesting, we try to compare this calibrated emission with the uh, modeling of, of uh, passion recombination continuum to see whether this is consistent with our previous detection from HMI. And so this is the, this is the pass band of, of the filter. And we found that, uh, that there is some discrepancy. We could not, we, we got, uh, we got uh, different, uh, different results. The, the intensity detected from SST chromis was larger, about a factor of two from that predicted by uh, modeling of passion recombination continuum. And then Peter, we found- a 10, minute, a 10 minute warning. Yeah, yeah, I will finish. And then we found very interesting a point that in fact, uh, because this channel is close to H beta line, so this bright core of, of the loop is uh, strongly emitting by H beta, which uh, Julius Koza will demonstrate. And when we uh, carefully calculated stark broadening at these high densities, we got significant contribution of stark wing at this wavelength. So this contributed uh, almost by the same amount as the passion continuum. So this was very interesting. And this is uh, the work in progress. Uh, by the way, such high electron densities from white light observations of loops, they have been already reported <coughs> years ago by, by uh, Hie et al. And also I found some, we found some earlier work done at HAO on the same topic, which is also historically interesting. And finally, I probably don't have much time, but uh, you can look at this paper uh, from last year where we uh, studied the same loops, but we focused on the absorption features because if you see dark loops in EUV channels of AIA, you can expect that this will be classical EUV absorption, which is described in these papers. But in fact, and this is my last slide, we found that, uh, that it is not uh, completely true because there is some contribution from helium uh, continua. So, so emission in the helium continuum in the loops. So the detailed study of this uh, absorption plus helium continuum emission is, is done in this, in this paper. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Any question for Pat? I have a question. Um, so you mentioned the stark broadening uh, for, for this event, Petr, and um, uh, uh, can you comment, um, is, is, is that stark broadening its significance because of the line of sight? No, or... this is, uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, we made some simulations, uh, preliminary simulations with, with uh, radiative transfer modeling. Actually, this is the same what we did with Julius Koza to diagnose uh, H-beta and calcium line from SST. You, you are co-author of the paper. Yes. Yeah. And uh, then I edit uh, stark broadening mechanism and uh, I, I got this quantitative result. 
that at the position of this wide band filter, we can get some significant contribution from stark broadening. So this is nothing very, very special, but uh, it is, uh, it is uh, indication of high densities, of course, because stark broadening uh, does work for higher densities. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sargam Mulei, and um, she will talk uh, about evidence of chromospheric molecular hydrogen emission in a solar flare observed by the IRIS satellite. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Sarkar Murey. I'm a postdoc from University of Glasgow, UK. Uh, I work with Professor Lindsay Fletcher, and today I will be presenting IRIS solar flare observations and show you some evidences for molecular hydrogen at flare ribbons. The results are recently published in MRRS. So, H2 has a formation temperature around 4200 Kelvin, which corresponds to temperature minimum region. H2 emission formed by photo excitation fluorescence process by ultraviolet radiation from the transition region. So we studied emission from molecular hydrogen H2 at 1333.79 Armstrong, which was observed at flare ribbons. This H2 line is fluorescently excited by silicon four line at 1402.77 Armstrong. On the right hand side, I'm showing you goes X-ray fluxes for M7.3 flare in two soft X-ray channels along with the derivatives. The ultraviolet uh, signature of this flare were observed at um, in AI 1600 channel and which shows two bright flare ribbons. We identified these ribbons as northern ribbon and southern ribbon. You can see this ribbon structure over here. The black box shows uh, the iris literature field of view uh, in this image and the zoomed view you can see in this. So. This is a set sentence layer observation with a cadence of 10 seconds. And using this observation, we studied the behavior of H2 emission and plasma parameters during various phases of the flare. We studied the correlation between H2 and silicon 4. Uh, we also learned about the optical properties of the plasma using intensity ratio of two silicon 4 lines. So I would like to show this movie. Uh, this is a movie of IRS. HJI move uh, in silicon four channel, and you can see the evolution of M7.3 flare. And you can see here the southern ribbon, which actually moved towards the south direction. So this movement of this uh, southern ribbon is nicely captured in spectral images. So you can see this emission over here. Uh, these are the spectral images of H2 in these two panels, and this is for the silicon four lines. So in the left panel, these are the spectral images that were created by summing the data numbers over the wavelength ranges. So these are the wavelength ranges I mentioned here. And in the middle panel, we have spectral images, uh, which are at single wavelength values of H2 and silicon four. So emission from R1 and R2 are indicated here. This is from R1 and this is from R2. It is clearly observed that there is a movement of ribbon one towards the south direction, whereas there is no movement of uh, ribbon two. We can see that H2 emission becomes visible when we have silicon four emission quite bright. Uh, there is no emission available before the flare, even though we can see a little emission in silicon four. So you can see in this region, there is no emission in H2. Uh, the H2 line is strongest during the flare impulsive phase, dims during the cold peak, and brightens again during the gradual phase. So the silicon four emission was, al was also observed throughout the flare evolution. At a single wavelength value of silicon four line, we can see a similar behavior in this. Uh, R2 is very bright in both uh, the total silicon four intensity plot and at, at the port. 0.2.77 plot, but H2 at that same time is quite faint in R2. This is an example of average uh, spectra for H2 and silicon four lines. Silicon four line is quite broad and needed multiple Gaussian to fit the line. Uh, this is the only slit positions where we actually observed uh, emission from 
h2 line at 1333.47 uh, and has sufficient count to fit the line h2 line at 1333 which is this one uh, was uh, was brighter than the other h2 line and was used um, for further analysis and we use single gaussian to fit this line so the doppler velocities were small and consistent with zero within the errors indicating negligible small crew along the line upside and non thermal velocities were ranging from 7 to 18 km per second. Further, we created scatter plots for both uh, ribbon emission, which show a positive correlation between the intensities. The correlation coefficient for both ribbons is same order of magnitude, but the gradient is differed by 50%. So from the spectral images, we have seen that ribbon 2 is very bright at silicon 4 lines but at the same time and location h2 was faint so this is seen also in the Scholler gradient uh, for the r2 scatter plot this one here uh, this might be due to different opacities at both flare ribbons locations at two rib at both uh, ribbon locations uh, which crosses different regions as well and we have different temperature density and opacity structure at those ribbons as compared to the effects map to the out of your set out 1999 is 10% by 2018. Uh, further, we investigated this by using spectroscopic diagnostic tool, the intensity ratio of two silicon four lines. We studied the optical thickness of the plasma at flare ribbon locations. Uh, the plasma is considered to be optically thin if silicon four intensity ratio is two. The ratio plot is shown here. And uh, you can see uh, the black counter shows the uh, ribbon one and emission from ribbon two. Uh, the dark red patches that shows the pixel locations where silicon four is saturated. For R1, during the rising phase of the flare, uh, the intensity ratio is two, which is consistent with the optical kin value. So you can see in this region. Uh, for R1 uh, at Gauss peak, which is around this timing, the intensity ratio is between 1.8 and 2, which indicates there is an increase in the opacity effect. And for R2 locations, there are some patches where the ratio is greater than 2. There might be a contribution from resonance scattering. On the right hand side, here I'm showing you the hist histograms for silicon 4 intensity ratios for two ribbons. This shows a greater tendency for, uh, for the ratio to be less than 2 in ribbon 1 and greater than 2 in ribbon 2. So recent flare simulations by Grand Care that demonstrated that opacity effect can lead to a range of ratios between uh, 1.8 and 2.3, um, and this needs further investigation. So now I shall summarize the results. We have observed H2 emission in flare ribbons. H2 was strongest during flare impulsive phase, dims during the cool peak, and brightens again during the gradual decay phase. H2 line was broadened and showed non thermal velocities between 7 and 18 km per second. Uh, H2 Doppler shifts were small, indicated negligible bulk flow along the line of sight. The plasma was optically thin during the impulsive phase of the flare, and in contrast, we also noted the role for opacity effects where the ratio differs from 2. So, in conclusion, I would like to mention that there was a strong spatial and temporal correlation between H2 and silicon 4 emission. It supports the notion that fluorescent excitation is responsible. We believe that H2 emission gave a new view to look at the temperature minimum region during flares, and our study provided useful constraint for further modeling. Now, I briefly talk about our current work. Currently, we are studying three solar flares using five seconds cadence observation from IRIS. This observation captured a full spectra and has number of H2 lines. The objective of our research is to understand the behavior of H2 lines along with other cool lines such as carbon-1, one, oxygen-1, one, sulfur-1, one, and fluorine-1. Uh, I'm showing you here uh, ghost, light, uh, ghost light curves for three flares and these are the iris jaw images at peak time of the flares. So in this work, we are focusing on four H2 lines, which are originated due to silicon four photons at 1393 and 1402 Armstrong. I have highlighted these uh, lines here. 
according to P and R branches, where the vibration quantum number here uh, remains the same, but the rotation quantum number, this one, that changes. Uh, these are the intensity plot for these four lines. Uh, you can see the intensity of these H2 lines of P branch is higher than the intensity of this H2 line of R branch. So we are investigating this and uh, there are some unresolved questions as well. So how does the change in rotational quantum number that affect the intensity of this H2 lines? Uh, we are also uh, working on a couple of other uh, questions as well. Uh, one of the question is, why does the behavior of this H2 line change rapidly with the time scale of five seconds? And why don't we see the H2 line at 1333 1333.47, even though the other H2 lines are present? Uh, why do we see a stationary and moving component in one H2 line, but not in other? Even though the same silicon four line at 1402 Armstrong is responsible for emission of this both two H2 lines. And okay, we'll that's, be, uh, ten, 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, and we will be including results from Radin simulations as well, which will help us to understand the role of silicon four lines in producing H2 emission. So one of the question is, uh, what is the silicon four in minimum intensity or other parameters from the Radin at temperature minimum region during flares? And further, we would like to know um, how does the temperature evolve in temperature minimum region during flares. And uh, these are the key references which I have used for this study. And I would like to acknowledge support from UK SDFC. And I would like to thank NASA and IRIS team for their open data policy. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions, comments. Thank you. Thank you, Sargam. Uh, the ice question from Brigitte Schmieder in Q&A. Can you still compute the ratio of silicon four in the FLIA ribbon when they are very broad? They may consist of two or more components. Uh, it is difficult to get the ratios uh, if you just only consider the intensities by fitting the line, uh, by fitting the line uh, with a single Gaussian or multiple Gaussian. Uh, so in this case, we are actually sticking to the uh, range of wavelength where we can see silicon four lines and we are taking that uh, intensity in those wavelength range to compute the silicon four ratio. Uh, there is another question from Paolo Simos. Under what conditions would H2 be present? How would we have to change the temperature minimum region to explain H2 there? Colder, hotter? Uh, it's, 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 co it's colder uh, because uh, H2 has a formation temperature around 4,200 Kelvin. And we are working on this. Uh, we would like to know uh, what is the role of silicon for intensity that actually plays, um, that actually is responsible for H2 emission. So we would like to see a silicon for minimum intensity that actually affects the uh, formation of H2. So that, that we are working on using Radin simulations. We are not, uh, we are not, we have not uh, have any um, actual answer for this at the moment. Okay. Uh, in addition to Paolo's question, I also want to ask you uh, if you have investigated this, is there any change in the formation height of temperature minimum region uh, in, in flare atmospheres? How it uh, compares to quiet sun temperature minimum, I mean formation height with, with respect to photosphere? Okay, so uh, there is a simulation by um, Sarah, Sarah Yekli. She has mentioned that the, for, the formation height for the um, H2, which is around 650 kilometers above the photosphere, and that's according to her standard 1D model of the quiet sun. Six, 650. Oh, okay, okay. I think this is higher than uh, the temperature minimum in the quiet sun. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we have now coffee break and um, we will start at 11.45. Okay, I think we can start our next session now. First speaker is Paolo Simos and Paolo is going to talk about vertical structure of flare ribbons from AIA 1600 and 1700 angstrom images. 
Thank you, Datu. Thank you. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone, depending on your time zones. Uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to chat with you about this uh, somewhat ongoing work on the vertical structure on flare ribbons. Uh, and let's see if this works now. Uh, hope you can see the screen and everything. It should be fine. Yes. Yes, great. Okay, so I'll start with the good stuff first. We have this flare. So it's a, a, a fairly famous flare. I think everyone's seen this, uh, uh, some, some still shots from this flare every now and then. Uh, and we, we noticed something that for this event, if you look at the, the movie here in AI 1600, at the very edge at the limb of the sun here, you can see uh, a flare emission happening, which is not the main flare ribbon, the, ma the main flare of course is happening here, but then you have to, you see this, uh, the brightening appearing here. And I say, okay, maybe you can do something about this, uh, 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 investigating the vertical structure of flares and what's happening there without too many projection effects on this, um, from this uh, data set. But then it's just not about looking at what's happening with the, the in terms of the imaging and all that is what are we actually seeing when you look at the 1600 and 1700 images from AIA, right? Because uh, up to this point, most of the time we use these images is mostly for morphology. It's just, like, oh, here's a flare ribbons and how it looks and how bright it is and post phase and all that. Without too much concern of the actual spectral content on these, um, uh, these filters. Right? We, we are used to do that for the extreme ultraviolet images for DM analysis and all that. We look at the spectral lines that are going to those filters, but not so much in terms of the UV part of the AI data set. There are some um, exceptions to that. I mentioned here are by, by Ryan Milligan and Chang in John Chu a few years back. But most of the time, when we look at the literature back in the day, especially with Trace, that it had a similar somewhat filter, we look at and people say it's just continuum for the 1600 or carbon-4 plus continuum. And 1700 is just continuum. Which one, which continuum, what you're talking here, there's, there's some lacking uh, of information there. So we started to dig through that and try to figure out what, what's actually going on there. And so we can extract and use that information or at, at the very least avoid uh, any misinterpretation of the data sets. And just to give you an idea, this is uh, a comparison of the, the, the response functions or the filters of AIA for the UV, part, the extreme ultraviolet part, the UV part, all the filters are very narrow center of the, the spectral lines of interest. And that's why you can use for DEM analysis and all that. But the UV filters are quite white. That's 200 angstrom white roughly. So there's probably a lot going on in there that helps for the images. And then we dig through the literature and so we try to find what is, uh, what kind of observations we have in this part of the spectrum uh, uh, where is enough resolution to figure that out. And essentially we found that, that the observations are rare. We found this uh, uh, somewhat famous paper by Paul Breck in 96 with solstice, solstice. And we do see a flare, but this, this case is a time um, slit spe spectrograph. So that is just, it's not a snapshot here for the spectrum. This is time varying one. So depending on the wavelengths because it's sweeping through the, the, the wavelength range here. But we do see many of the lines that we know they're there. They're quite um, enhanced during the flare. So silicon-4, silicon-2, carbon-4, a whole bunch of other lines. Uh, but this is a time varying one. So we say, okay, maybe you can find something else. And then Skylab came to help us back from the 70s. Uh, many people know about Skylab and some of the data and the the, much of the information we know about the sun came from data uh, uh, from Skylab, from papers back in the 70s, early 80s. And digging through that, we actually found the data from the spectrograph, uh, the NRL 
SO82P spectrograph, the data is uh, for a particular flare, uh, for a particular observation was uh, discussed in a few papers, but essentially published by uh, Doyle Cook in 92 with the full resolution, uh, the spectral resolution. And there was, I think, I don't know, but there's some issues, I think, with the data set is used to be available online, so you could get the scanned version of the film set, the data sets. And then uh, to, I couldn't find last week, it just went back to the web page and the data is not there anymore. So I'm trying to figure that out. But we got at the time we got the data and we did the whole process of trying to, um, what's the word? Calibrate the data, extract the data from the film data, and then get the spectrum. And this is all in the paper we did back a few years back in 2019. And long story short, we have the spectrum for a flare and for a plage. So you could apply the, the AI filters to these data sets and get the uh, spectral content in terms of which lines the continua we are looking here. So essentially, you can see a whole bunch of many, 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 many lines. Uh, some continuum here, silicon two continuum. There's another part of silicon two continuum happening here. And breaking that down, again, long, long story short, for flare emission at 1600, we've mostly seen carbon four and a whole bunch of other lines, carbon one, uh, helium two, another line of carbon one, many other different lines, and a little bit of silicon continuum. For 1700, we're mostly seeing uh, carbon one and helium two lines. Again, contribution of many other, mostly chromospheric lines, but not so much in terms of continuum. For plage or quiet sun in general, then yes, we mostly see continuum emission. So now that we have an idea of that, it's hard to say we know that because it's just one observation to get that information, we could come back to this observation and say, okay, how can we extract that information, try to get a physical uh, structure of the flare ribbon, secondary flare ribbon, but nevertheless. And the good thing also is that we do have stereo observations. So you could try to figure out how actually close to the limb the, this ribbon is. So for when the flare happened, it was mostly uh, very, very close to limb in terms of the AA observation. Stereo B has some uh, images at the same time. So just using uh, Helio Viewer here to uh, overlap the images, we can see, I think, you hope you can see the ribbon here at the very limb. This is where the two images from Stereo and AA join together. So you can see that this, these ribbons are mostly at roughly 90 degrees to us. Uh, not entirely, but some bits are. So that does give us some confidence that you could look at this uh, mostly at, at the limb without too much of a projection effect. So we did the, the standard thing, slide through uh, with radio, cut, radio cuts through the images to get the, the, uh, the structure of the brightness for the, both filters here. And then with uh, the straightforward, just comparison of the enhanced emission sub and subtracting the pre-flare emission just to avoid all, there are some filter issues and some noise. Uh, so to get, to get just the flare emission to see the structure, which is always, of course, above the, the, um, the solar limb. You can see here a maximum gray where at the location of the solar limb. And this is rough. This is for one cut uh, at one time, just to show you how it goes. We get a height of about 1.8 megameters on the 1600 filters and 1.2 roughly megameters in terms of the 1700 um, emission. We try to re uh, remove some of the PSF um, contribution from this before doing these calculations just to get a slightly more precise measurement there. Now, we did this for the... Okay, thank you, almost there. So we did this for a 
uh, time varying uh, analysis fit with, with Gaussian profiles just to get an idea of the peak of the height and the width of this, uh, these ribbons. An interesting th thing here to see is that we do have a difference. The blue one here is 1600, so black is 1700. There's a rough difference here of about 0.7 megameters between them. Uh, the width are similar, but I'm not sure about the, the, the main width here. What's interesting to note is that if we think that the 1600s mostly, with several cold marks here, uh, carbon four uh, line, which is formed at uh, log T uh, five, and uh, 1700 from a mostly carbon one, well, helium two is roughly the same temperature, uh, log T uh, four, we're kind of seeing a temperature structure. And we had a quick look. This is not a simulation to explain this. It's just got, got some ratting runs uh, and without any pick and choose, just a random uh, kind of uh, a standard, let's say, ratting run uh, during uh, a flare simulation. And this is temperature. This is the temperature structure as a function of height. The, the darker red here shows the temperature. And related to the, temper the temperature formation of carbon four, for 1600 carbon one for 1700, we get a separation of about 0.6 megameters. And the, the main heights are also similar to the, 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 the heights we see from the data. So to wrap this up, uh, I think this is uh, one of the rarest observations at the LIMP. Dato has a paper on that that I, I'm still reading through, Dato. I apologize, I don't have that all <laughs> read by now, uh, but people should read that. Uh, and with that, I think we're getting some information of the temperature structure uh, on for ribbons, for the vertical structure, I should say. And we do get some similar, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, we got similar results roughly from the observations from the UV AIA for this particular observation and what we more or less know on the temperature formation of carbon four, carbon one, and chromospheric lines in those bands. Uh, I think there's also, of course, contribution from other lines, but mostly chromospheric. And even if you have the continuum emission here, I think the same way as Mihaly showed the uh, iron one for instance, has a flare contribution from the chromosphere, maybe all the stuff that we think is formed in the temperature minimum region, like silicon to continue, maybe it's during flares is also happening a little bit, bit up above in the chromosphere and contributing to these observations. And with that, I finish and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Paolo. Very exciting stuff. I think Hugh has a question. Yes, uh, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, Paolo, that's really great stuff and I'm, it's really impressive, but I'm wondering about your interpretation of the brightening at the extreme limb as a ribbon. I mean, you're calling it a ribbon, but it, it's sort of in the right time domain based upon your movie to, to be also possibly interpreted as part of the Morton, Morton wave excitation remote from the flare. Uh, yes, and I agree and disagree. I, yes, it's not the main flare ribbon, true. But at the same time, uh, there is, we don't see a, a the location of that excitation of that ribbon, I'm calling ribbon for now, is, <laughs> it's not a sweeping thing. It just happens at that location, which could be related, I think it is, to the um, field lines that are associated with the ejection. So as the, the ejection goes up and it just keeps uh, um, activating more, as uh, say ribbons. So it's not as the main thing. There are some other discussions to be had there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, in addition to this, the, Paolo, the first movie you showed us, I think it's, it's quite clearly suggests that it's sort of ribbon-like front is moving and it is appearing at the limb when, when, when it's close, when it's at the edge of the limb. So, why we cannot conclude that this is really ribbon. Um, 
I mean, probably it could, it, it is appearing at the edge of the limb because, because of the contrast, right? You don't have any more the background emission and the contrast is increasing. Um, sim similar brightening was detected in September, uh, nine, September 10, nine, the 2017 flares. Yeah. And we also detected this is in H beta. Okay, so it, yeah, I, I think it could be ribbon. It could be just yeah. normal flare ribbon. I, I agree. It's it's really flare related. It looks like a ribbon. There's for these events uh, I I mentioned as it's also if you look from the let's say from the other side is is on disk from AIA point of view. You do see also emission in the UV the UV stuff that is not connected to the main flare ribbon. So it's somewhat related somehow, not quite clear how, but to the eruption. So it could, do, it could still be flare-like in the sense that you have energy deposition and so on, that, but it's uh, probably associated with the continuing energy release that is happening as the eruption happens. So it's, it could be a similar process. I think it's a similar process as a flare, but it's not quite the main thing. That's okay. my view, yeah. Okay. Thank you again. And Thank you. now our next talk is Brandon Panos, and um, he's going to talk about spectral characteristics of flare events using machine learning. Great. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Perfect. So thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, the title of my talk is Spectral Characteristics of Flare Ribbons Using Machine Learning. And uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of um, Geneva. And I'm part of a group that really likes to derive general statements about solar flares. And in order to get these general statements, we obviously have to study multiple flares simultaneously. And in order to do that, very often we have to revert to using machine learning methods. So firstly, the um, spectra in the UV appears um, quite differently to in the quiet sun. If we take, for example, just the magnesium two line observed by IRIS, we see that the predominant spectral type is actually, so that here's the K and the H line, is actually to have the single peak profile. Uh, this is in contrast to the quiet sun spectral shape, which has this, if you see on the right here, this little central minima. And the quiet sun, this line profile has a formation height that extends from the upper um, photosphere to the upper chromosphere. And the photons from the core actually form quite high in the atmosphere. And uh, even though the temperature rises dramatically, the density decreases and therefore the source function decouples from the Planck function, doesn't follow the temperature, and we get this little um, uh, central reversal over here. But this is not the case in flares. And uh, although single peaks are what we generally see in magnesium, they're not always single peaked. And we get some really strange uh, looking spectral profiles. This is the magnesium K core um, at the edge of the flare ribbons. So in this case, these profiles are extremely broad, can be one angstrom, uh, uh, full width half maximum of one angstrom. And again, they inherit this central reversal, but um, the mechanism that causes this reversal is most likely very different to the mechanism that causes the reversal in the quiet sun. And then lastly, we have some dynamics uh, of the magnesium line during a flare. It starts this quiet sun profile, it becomes more intense and single peak. And then we reach these really outrageous looking spectral profiles, and then it relaxes back down to quiet sun. Now, the question here is how much of this behavior is endemic just to these uh, few flares? And is there something general at play here that we can derive? So, in order to derive a, a robust set of statistics that can either challenge or fortify our models, uh, we need to look at many flares. So this is a subsample of uh, our flare data set. 
and iris basically scrapes off spectra in multiple um, uh, pass bands where we see this colored in region and then we left with hundreds of millions of spectra so this is a whole new problem now if you want to do statistics on large data sets generally what you do is you bin the data and uh, look at some histograms now we use this technique called k-means that allows us to bin spectral shapes so similar spectral shapes uh, are grouped together in the same bin how this algorithm works is um, so first of all sorry Although we see spectra like this on the right, a machine just sees a single point in a multi-dimensional space. What the algorithm does is it initiates uh, these points called centroids. These centroids uh, attach themselves to the nearest data points, and then they update themselves according, according to the mean of their assignments. And basically, they spider their way through the data sets until they stop updating. At this point, they said to have converged. And um, now if we look at two of these bins, we can see the spectra that's inside the bins. Uh, in this one bin, we've got similar looking spectral shapes, although not identical. And there's some emission over here in I-21. I think this is from carbon one. And in another group, we, have, um, we don't have that emission. And now the point is that instead of analyzing every single data point here, we get rid of the high level information and just concentrate on the average of the spectra called this Android. Now this move allows us to do some uh, pretty useful things. Uh, firstly, we can perform a nearest neighbors, a neighbors algorithm and automatically locate all of those strange uh, central reversed ribbon uh, front profiles. So I, no I notice now that the images are quite small. But the spectra that look like this guy over here um, are indicated, their locations are indicated with a black mark. And even though these are four different flares, I think we came across this, this flare already in a previous talk, the panel C. Even though, even though they're all different, um, the location of these types of spectra are always, always respect the same topology at the leading edge of the moving flare ribbon. And just to convince you, if you look at where the black um, indicators occur on this flare, you can see that they're at the front of the flare ribbon. There are some misclassifications, but it's generally at the front of the flare ribbon. So what this tells us is that the um, topology of where these profiles appear across multiple flares are extremely consistent. And an the next question we want to answer is, is the dynamics of the magnesium line um, consistent between flares? So if I look down a single pixel during a flare, does the line evolve in the same way for every flare? So we look at these bins in more detail. I took the black spectral profile and split it into two ribbon front spectra. So we've got this one over here in green and then a slightly broader enhanced version in cyan. And then we've also got uh, this group with single peak, very broad spectra, and then single peak, less broad concave shapes, and then finally um, downflow spectra. And what you see on the bottom here is a spectrogram that includes the Irish, uh, sorry, iris uh, line core and a little bit of the triplet emission. And um, you can see these little colored grids at the top, and they tell us that the spectra at, let's say, location 100 is uh, most similar in shape to the spectra seen in this group, the sign group over here. And the points that I want to demonstrate here is that instead of analyzing these very complicated spectrograms, now in order to describe the dynamics of this line, we just have to look at the order of the colors. So the story seems to be, at least from this particular flare and this pixel, the story seems to be we go from quiet sun to single peaked, then we get these ribbon front spectra, they become broad, relaxed back down within about a minute or three minutes. Then we get really broad single peak profiles that decay in their width, and then finally downflows. 
And again, we want to see if this is a general uh, behavior of the line in different flares and different pixels. And we actually see the same thing. So for instance, you see this green and uh, cyan always appears in the front, followed by yellow and orange single peaks and then downflows. And over here, there's a great example of how the magnesium line, the central reversal, migrates away from uh, it basically blue shifts and then relaxes back down. And if we look at two separate flares and instead of looking down each pixel, we aggregate um, all of the pixels together. So uh, you see the ghost curve for this flare over here. And at each instance in time, we basically just counted the number of occurrence of each of these groups. And we see that these uh, central reversed um, green profiles are confined to the impulsive phase, confined to the impulsive phase. And then in a different flare from a different year, we get the same pattern. So the conclusion for magnesium is that remarkably um, similar topological restraints in terms of where these profiles occur with respect to the flare ribbon. And in terms of the dynamics, they are also very similar between flares. So that's magnesium, but there's a bunch of other lines. And uh, we would like to know what these lines are doing uh, during these ribbon front uh, profiles. So Iris sees all of um, these lines simultaneously. So it's not absurd to imagine that we could calculate the probabilities of these lines. And the idea here is that given that this type of magnesium spectra occurs, what are the probabilities, for instance, that uh, we see a particular shape in iron 21? That's two minutes left, Brandon. Sorry, how many? Two minutes. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, we again use k-means, we really stretch its utility. Um, we get the groups for magnesium for these x, so there's 10 groups here, this is group six. We do the same thing, let's say for iron 21. And then what we do is um, each time that these groups occur simultaneously in the data set, we join the two nodes with, um, with a uh, link over here. And then when we plot the iron 21 spectra, what we can do is that we can show display the probabilities in terms of color, which tells us how many times uh, these nodes are connected. So in other words, the red is more probable than the blue. And under the hood, there's some details. You have to, well, when you're plotting thousands of spectra in a single plot, you have to order them. This is a, uh, the best way to order them is to find the shortest Hamiltonian path. And there's a nice method to do that. And then you also have to compress sometimes away uh, really noisy spectra. So the pipeline goes as follows. Given uh, that you observe this magnesium profile, you put it in, it collects all the co-occurring spectra, orders them, compresses if necessary, and then projects the probability map. And after all of this toil, uh, here are the fruits and the rewards. So um, basically when these outrageous uh, ribbon front profiles occur in magnesium, we can see what's happening in the other lines. Uh, again, the red is more probable than the blue. And what we can see is that this central reversal on magnesium also occurs in carbon two and silicon four. And silicon four seems to uh, display optically thick line form formation, which uh, seems to be in line with the previous talk. And iron, Iron uh, 2 is also an emission during the impulse phase, meaning deep atmospheric heating. So if you want to, you probably uh, are more up to date with the physics um, than I am. So if you want to dig into interpreting these profiles, please go and look at the paper and there are my conclusions. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Any question for Brandon? Yes, Lindsay. Hi, uh, thanks, Brandon. I was just wondering, um, when you're doing the initial k-means, do you get problems associated with with noisy data? I mean, does it overclassify because you've got so because you've got noise on the data, or is noise not really a problem with these strong lines? Um, well, this is an in detailed uh, uh, problem to solve. Um, 
in terms of uh, noise, if we just want to get rid of the quiet sun, we use a VAE. So there's some pre-processing that basically just takes pixels that are associated with a flare. In other words, we, we, we truncate off of all of the non-flaring type spectrum. Um, then in terms of cosmic rays, we tried not to collect data uh, when iris goes over the SSA, um, but we also have an algorithm to remove that. And uh, there are, there's no clean answer, but there are several steps to remove noisy spectra, missing data. And we basically have a filter that, uh, that checks. If we push the spectra through the filter. And uh, if, it's, if it's good, it gets to the end. If not, it goes into our rubbish. And we see whether it actually is rubbish um, in hindsight. Yeah. Thank you. Paolo. Hello, thank you. I'll just use my opportunity here since I'm here. Uh, Brandon, thank you for your work. I, I'd like to provoke you on, a, on your last point there on the iron two emission being from the deep atmospheric heating. As I thought, Mihaly first uh, talk when you mentioned the iron one maybe being formed in, at chromospheric heatings during flares. And that's an impression we have. We discussed quite a lot back in the day of F, back the days of F chroma. So it might be interesting to look into that formation heights of these lines that we think are photospheric or TMR, but that when a flare happens, they might be a bit above. Yeah. So uh, just to sure. poke you. <laughs> sure. sure, no, 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 that's a good point. It's not as simple as that, right? When, when you have a flare, all of these heights mix and change. And yeah, so the assumption is, is pretty rickety. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, there are some more questions in the Q&A, so please check it. Uh, we need to move now to another talk. And uh, our next speaker is Aaron Monson. And Aaron is going to talk about solar, fl solar flare-induced photospheric velocity diagnostics and stellar applications. Yeah, so um, that's actually a great tie-on from Paolo's question comment there. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, you've heard a bit about my work earlier from Mahalis. I'm going to go into a bit more detail, but if it's a bit rushed, you can just check out the paper which came out earlier this year. But what I do <laughs> is uh, the reason of hydrodynamic modeling of using Radin and the RH codes to try and synthesize uh, the deep forming iron one lines for several uh, different flare scenarios. I've been using the F-Chroma archive of 72 different flare models to do this for different electron beam parameter heating mechanisms. Uh, but for this talk, I'm going to primarily focus on this uh, beam parameter uh, combination here. Quite a hard and energetic beam, uh, 311 ergs per centimeter squared, so quite an energetic flare. Um, this is just because it drives the greatest photospheric velocities uh, from this study. Um, and that's really what the purpose of this talk is. We want to diagnose the retrieval velocity information of deep forming spectral lines in the atmosphere. So once we've got our model, we can port it over to RH and do line synthesis for these spectral lines of interest. Uh, we've namely been focusing on the 6173, uh, which has been the focus of some previous works, the 6301 and 6302 lines, all deep forming in the mid to lower photosphere. Again, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus just on the 6301 line um, as it shows the greatest extent of the discussed effects. I'm gonna guide you through the simple um, one, this one test case scenario as it forms quite a nice story. In this model, I have just plotted here how the induced velocity by the flare changes with time through these different colors here. I'm gonna see that the basic takeaway is from a stationary atmosphere, you get flowing upflows so on the order of a few hundred meters per second, peaking towards the end of these model times at about a kilometer per second here um, on the right-hand side at the top of the photosphere. As I said before, we're interested in seeing what retrieval velocity information we can get from spectral lines during the flare. Uh, the 6301 line and the other lines all form about this 200 to 300 kilometer range in the quiet sun. So be expecting to find velocities on the order of a couple hundred meters per second upflows, ideally from this case. You will have seen, however, from the house talk this morning that when we do this and we um, plot out how the line profile changes with time from the pre-flare to the maximum flaring here, um, we see in the models, the maximum flaring 
um, intensity for the line core happens a few seconds after maximum beam heating, which is in agreement with the literature. But when we do this and actually do like a Doppler fitting of this, this line profile appears redshift in nature, which was quite a surprise given that we've seen before from the RAND model, we expected the blue shift. And um, when you actually do the subtraction, taking away the pre-flare profile from the flaring profile, what you end up seeing is this kind of emission hump here, which Mahal has highlighted earlier. And when you look at it, you do see this blue shift in nature. It is peaking to the left-hand side of the rest wavelength here. And that's good. It is the blue shift we expected, which is one point in our favor. And what the effect of this is this left side blue shifted material fills in the left side slightly, causing the entire profile to be shifted slightly to the right, appearing red shift in nature when it's actually made up of a blue component. The interesting point still here, however, is this velocity here for the blue shifted component during the beam heating phase is on the order of 500 meters per second to up to nearly a kilometer per second, which is far too fast for these lower mid, uh, mid to lower photosphere regions we talked about previously for where the line is formed. So it really becomes a question of, this is far too quick to be photospheric in nature. So where is it coming from? This is what ties in nicely to uh, what Paolo has just been discussing there a moment ago. I'll use the contribution function to look into this for the iron one lines. And we see here, I saw the question earlier to Mahalis, so I've gone into a bit more detail. The contribution function will peak at two key moments. Uh, when the optical depth approaches one for the, uh, that wavelength, so you can see here in the pre-flare state, it's very much a photospheric line formed deep in the atmosphere here. The second term though, which becomes relevant during the flare itself and during beam heating, is when you have a dense, there's the density of optical emitters at a low optical depth, this term is, becomes relevant in the chromosphere. All it is is just the strong velocity gradients or dense shock waves or condensation fronts, any of those things which cause a dense number of emitters at a low optical depth mean that the chromosphere can significantly contribute to these spectral lines which are deeper formed. And really that's shown here when we show it during the beam heating phase that the entire chromosphere begins to light up and causes a significant contribution to these deep forming line profiles and that fast moving blue component we saw earlier, which couldn't be photospheric in nature, it was traveling too quick. We actually begin to see that it's coming from the, the chromosphere here, well above photospheric heights. And this chromospheric velocity can mask the actual photospheric velocities we're looking for and are interested in. This is well and good. We're actually getting to see the cause of it here. And I can really highlight it here from this plot here. Uh, there's two panels, the focus on the top one to start in which I've got the fitted Gaussian of the bite of the velocity and time. Um, and you can see here, it does a red shift and the blue shift. I've also got this green triangle here, which is just the beam heating profile, just there for temporal context. What we really see here is the beam heating ramps up. We begin to see this red shift emerge or apparent red shift. We've seen before, it's actually constituted of two blue shifted components of the photosphere slowly upflowing and the more fast upflowing chromosphere filling that left-hand side. And we see that's really clear here of when you look at how much the chromosphere contributes to these line profiles, this is again for the 6301 line. During this time of this maximum red shift here, we see the chromosphere is contributing up to 25% of the total line profile. So we get this clear correlation of when the chromosphere is most greatly contributing and the clear red shift. Then as the beam heating begins to die down, and the chromosphere begins to uh, reduce its contribution function. This is just the integration of the contribution function through the chromosphere. We begin to see this blue shift emerge at later times, which is actually indicative of the photospheric velocities at this time. This real switchover from the red shift to blue shift is a combination of two parts. First part being that this chromospheric contribution begins to die down and it restores just to more the photosphere giving its information when we observe the total line profile. And then at these times here, later on in the model after the beam heating, the photosphere is really starting to accelerate and um, show those upflows of hundreds of meters per second I showed previously. What I should note though is you might have seen the um, Later times in the model, about the 42nd mark was where the photosphere reached about a corner of a second upflow. And these aren't reflected in these spectral lines. So there's only a very narrow window where we can actually get somewhat retrieval velocity information from the photosphere. 
Now this study here, and I'm not much about the HALIS, we're getting meters per second changes in these line profiles. Very, very slow observationally compared to the kilometers per second we see in chromospheric lines. And because they're photospheric lines, because of this order of magnitude, it does become relevant more for a stellar flare case. So it really led to the thought exercise of, well, let's expand this out from solar cases and explore a few stellar cases as well on top of that. I'm really seeing as well a secondary component of chromospheric effects and uh, conditions and features such as condensation fronts, shock waves, so on, can be the dominant feature which causes a change in a line profile. So let's do a bit of an experiment and see what we can pick up in more of a stellar case. What I'm going to show you here is a model made by Anne Kowalski. It's detailed fully in the Zoo et al. 2019 paper. And the reason we picked this model, it's a 10 to 13 ergs per centimeter squared model. A very energetic uh, super flare for our sun uh, or a very, very energetic one for stellar flare scenario. What we see from the excessive energy input here is that when I play the movie, we see a very steep density gradient which is formed in the atmosphere. You'll see it move downwards through time. And it's very interesting. We can see, we've seen before, we can pick up chromospheric features, but this propagates all the way down into photospheric heights here. So it's a really interesting feature of, can we pick up this chromospheric condensation front moving downwards in a deep formula line profile? And additionally, can we pick up when it begins to hit the photospheric region? I'll play it here. Yeah. And hits the photosphere, begins to dissipate, and the effect this could have on deep forming line profiles. So with this in mind, I'm going to show you the story of how the 6301 line profile, again, evolves throughout the course of this model. And how it actually can be some time. Two minutes? Two minutes left, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. So we see the case of beam heating begins, we get a similar increase in intensity as we did in the f chroma case, just from beam heating. But as soon as that uh, condensation front forms, we get a sudden jump in intensity. Now there's no real line asymmetries in this stage here, um, as the condensation is still well above the photospheric region. But as this begins to propagate downwards and this condensation hits photospheric regions, we get a clear excess in the red wing, which we expect is just downwards propagating. And then as it begins to slow, it fills the line core more. And then actually, as the atmosphere begins to relax again, it compresses all the way down. And then after the beam heat ends, that atmosphere relaxes back up a bit. We can see in these deep forming line profiles, indications that um, in the blue side is slightly more filled than the red side, indicating it's beginning to relax back up. This is great for a very well sampled um, thing in the models. We did a test case as well of what if we only had three key wavelengths, the left, the core and the right wing. What we end up seeing, and I'll skim through this for time's sake, is for the left wing, we've got the change in the intensity of the flux here in the black, and then also just the integrated contribution function from the shock wave just alone. What we get here is for the left-hand side here, an increase in intensity largely dominated and by the shock wave we can see. So it's the shock wave nearly entirely dominating the uh, change of the left wing, and that diminishes with time peaking several seconds after the maximum beam heating again. The core itself, while the max, the change in intensity follows a similar profile, we see that it's the heating of the photosphere and the shock contribution contribute to it. And what we don't pick up is the integrated shock contribution for the line core directly. Um, the secondary hump as it slows and hits zero velocity in the photosphere, we don't pick that up in the total change in uh, flux. But the right side core, we see right here, this green dash line corresponds to the time at this hump here. And we do see that we see both peaks of the initial one of the jump intensity from the formation of the shock. And we clearly see the case of the second hump as the right side is filled and uh, is due to the shock wave, ideally. But you can pick up a couple of key points of when the shock wave hence hits the photosphere, um, the peak time or when it's formed and the jump in intensity here. And then if this was maybe another cut case sample, so something slightly higher up, pick up the core when it hits zero velocity. I'll chuck up my conclusions here. Um, and if you're interested in the first half of this talk, you can read the paper. But we've seen a couple of cases for our stellar applications as well. And thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron.
Any questions for Aaron? I can see Alberto's hand, but it could be from previous talk. Um, I can take them in the Q and A. Sure, to keep us on time. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Thank you again. So, uh, our next speaker is Julius Koza from Tatranska Lomnica Observatory, and uh, Julius will tell us about spectral diagnostics of cool FLIA loops observed by the SST. In September 2017, uh, during and right after a uh, solar physics meeting, which held uh, in Budapest, uh, the sun displayed a chain of magnificent uh, flares. And one of them is uh, shown in uh, this uh, front slide. And uh, this uh, flare will be a central point of my talk, not because it was the second largest uh, flare of the past solar cycle with uh, large uh, geo-effectiveness, but because this uh, flare is uh, a bridge to our understanding of uh, stellar superflares. The Kepler Space Telescope uh, provided us with lots of new discoveries of uh, extrasolar, extrasolar planets, but it's a very important contribution to uh, bring uh, stellar flares uh, into context closer to the solar flares is the long list of <clears throat> observations of super flares, <clears throat> of sort of, sort, uh, sort of uh, super flares and just for comparison, a typical solar flare is a total energy in, in 10 to the power of 29 or up to 10 to the uh, uh, 32. Uh, in the central plot, uh, you can see uh, a light curve of one super flare catched by the Kepler mission and uh, striking peak in the middle is an example of extremely strong super flare with total energy of about uh, three times 10 to the uh, 35. Uh, Kepler super flares are in a solar parlance, a white light flare, and uh, it's a highly recommendable review on this uh, uh, topic can be found in the recent paper by Hugh Hudson in annual uh, review of astronomy and astrophysics, uh, which uh, comments on the relevance of uh, term superflare uh, towards this uh, towards the Carrington event from uh, 1859, uh, which can be considered as one of the all time greatest solar events, but not uh, as a superflare because a border or a limit between uh, solar flares and superflare is somewhere in the energy in 10 to 33. Uh, in, uh, let's say, one of uh, another inter important step towards the understanding of superflares was a discovery of uh, uh, offering uh, flare loops in HMI continuum images, and they can provide a potential clue uh, towards the stellar superflare emissions. <clears throat> Martinez Oliveros and Sam Hiller. Uh, analyzed the HMI observations of a loop prominent system, which is shown in the left panel uh, at the background, so where you can clearly see a loop like structure topped with the strong uh, X ray uh, emission. And uh, this loop like structure uh, seems to have a, high, a rather high loop electron density of the order two times 10 to the power of 12. Just for comparison, a typical uh, electron density in prominence is, is about two orders lower. So there is a significant difference in the physics of these two uh, structures. And it is going to be a uh, very uh, frequently uh, repeated quantity characterizing the flare loops. So the question is if uh, um, flare loops can somehow to contribute to the white light emission of stellar, stellar superflares uh, discovered or 
uh, reported by Kepler observations. Current uh, interpretation of superflare emission is that it is a white light continuum emissions mostly from ribbons. And Peter Hansel and uh, Shibata suggested that actual white light superflare emission can be a mixture of the ribbon and loop, loop emission. And it can be even a loop dominated due to significant emitting area of loops uh, if seen at the rim. But uh, uh, the enhanced emission requires electron density of the order of 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 13 or even higher. And assuming uh, optically thin group with the plasma in LTE, then the continuum emissivity of layer loops scales with the square of uh, electron number densities. So therefore, in the rest of my talk, I will concentrate on uh, the on, uh, uh, confirmation of previous uh, evidence of high electron density in these loop flares made uh, by HMI uh, observations of these labs. So the aim is to present the imaging spectroscopy of Oblin flare loops from the 10th of September 2017, acquired by SST instrument CRISP and CROMIS, and to present the results of the data inversion at the bright loop apex using the 1D nanot radiative transfer code based on the numerical technique MARI. So, uh, the SST observation commenced just two minutes after the peak of the, uh, of, of the flare, and they involved spectral uh, imaging spectroscopy and calcium and HB line, where these two lines were dominant in the setup with quite dense sampling. And uh, there are also some observations in the continua. Here is an example of one. Uh, snapshot or one, let's say, uh, profile scan of these two lines when the left panels uh, show the line core image of the flare loops, uh, the central panels show wing uh, images and the right panels show far wing images taken in both uh, lines. So within our study, we employed just data taken at the, at the bright apex uh, of the profiles in order to, uh, to uh, compensate for large Doppler shifts observed in the uh, foods uh, of, of, the, of the pairs. And because our technique, our inversion technique, uh, takes into account only static plasma without any motion. So in the central uh, image, you see the overlay of HMI continuum in the, in the background co-aligned with the H beta contours, so uh, the small orange uh, orange square in the center shows the uh, point from which we took uh, the profiles for further inversion. Uh, these are typical calcium and H beta profiles coming from the brightest apex. So apparently they are highly reversed with some small uh, intensity uh, difference and uh, the observed line profile samples are missing in the far wings of the H beta. And therefore, we perform a double Gaussian fitting of uh, these far wings in order somehow to extrapolate the observed intensities and to be able to compare them with the observations. So the basic uh, of the geometry of the loop uh, is uh, indicated in this schematic rendering and uh, using uh, available Doppler velocity, we were able also to estimate the geometry or the uh, viewing angle between line of sight velocity and the plane of the sky of the loop, so which entered also into the non LTE modeling. So, uh, We adopted a kind of uh, grid-based to the force inversion when our inversion meant it was just exploring the shape of 4D uh, merit function represented by uh, four parameters, in particular kinetic temperature, gas pressure, slap width sequence, and microturbulence. 
and uh, using this quantity, we created a large database of uh, synthetic profiles, which were then compared with the observations in double line regime or single line regime. So it means the comparing simultaneously uh, observations of both lines or separately uh, each, each line. Here are a quickly uh, example of uh, this approach for one particular time moment when the black lines at the background show the observed lines profiles and extrapolations uh, resulting from that Gaussian fitting. I'll, I'll, two minutes remaining. Thank you. Thank you. So inversion in this way uh, provided us with some ambiguity results because we found two different uh, thickness of the of the loops uh, which are able to reproduce uh, reproduce uh, our observations but in the generally when you will look on the result uh, on, on the resulting uh, electron number densities they are largely consistent with all previous uh, uh, inferences of uh, electron number densities from previous observations. So therefore, uh, let's have a look on the uh, results of inversion in another time moments. So in generally, we were able to reproduce uh, general behavior of observed line profiles, but apparently there are problems in the central reverse cell of uh, calcium line and in the far wings of uh, H beta line. So when we, uh, when we decreased the micro turbulence, we were able to uh, reproduce even the central reversal, but not uh, satisfactory uh, the, the wing. So there is a problem with uh, technical problem with the stark uh, broadening of the calcium profiles uh, which plays a role in the ring. So in general, we can conclude that the inversion of the SST profiles is compatible with the scenario of uh, overdense loops and uh, adopting uh, even the coronal abundance uh, also provides uh, the high uh, electron number densities in the loop. So, and these parameters may serve for at least a rough estimating of white light emission of offering loops in stellar superflares. And uh, I will end up with the goals which are ahead of us in order to, uh, let's say, to provide some kind of full blood confirmation of our results. Thank you. Thank you, Julius. Is there any questions for Julius? Yes, Lindsay. Um, hi, Julius. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I missed this. But what were the what are the uh, bulk flow speeds along the loops here? Uh, in our study, we concentrated on the static part of the loop at the top. But uh, I remember that the that the that the, the foods are all the velocities of the order of fifty or even eighty kilometers per second were recorded. I can recommend to check the paper of Dato Kuridze from uh, 2019. Okay, thank you. There are, there are shown. Thank you again, Julius. Uh, wait, I think Hugh has question. Yeah, I just wanted, this is very interesting, uh, very nice. I'm just uh, curious uh, about following up on the suggestion of Heinzel and Shibata that these uh, uh, white light loops above the limb would contribute, might contribute to the stellar super flares. And the question is, if such a flare happened at disk center on a star, uh, what would you predict that it's, uh, what it would do to the uh, stellar time series? Would it be bright? Uh, would it actually, or might it be dark because of scattering out? Mm -hmm. My opinion is that uh, on disk position of the super flare is not, not favorable to see it uh, uh, or to, to be detectable as a super flare because of two reasons. Watching on the flare loops on this means that the, uh, the thickness of the loop is, uh, uh, you know, uh, very small and therefore the, the resulting uh, intensity is small and also the effective area of the emitting uh, 
of the emitting fire is much smaller compared to the much more favorable situation at the end. So therefore, I would prefer that uh, whenever we witness super fires, it's mostly a uh, a uh, limp, uh, uh, limp occurrence of uh, very large flare limbs. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So the next part of our uh, meeting is dedicated to poster session. And uh, we have a very interesting poster session here. Uh, the first speaker is Hugh Hudson and the title of Hugh's talk is uh, Hughes poster is infrared and millimeter wave observations of FLIA foot points. Right, thank you. Uh, am I coming through okay? Yes, yes. Right, so this poster is very simple. Uh, the, the basic uh, stimulus for it was the meeting on phaser that happened about uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, trying to design a radio telescope uh, for the future. And uh, the question is about the continuum observations that one could make at millimeter wavelengths. And of course, we are quite familiar with the continuum observations of flares in the form of white light flares, and they're very interesting. The continuum is either free free or free bound, and we still don't really know exactly how it works out uh, geometrically. And uh, another comment just about that is that recently flares have been observed at 10 microns, and this is uh, beyond the free bound continua and it's basically just free free. So the, this poster attempts to answer the question, how observable are uh, the chromospheric parts of flares uh, via radon simulations? And the, as you know, in soft x-rays uh, on the left, you can see a very nice simple uh, loop flare with bright foot points seen in soft x-rays means 10,000 degrees, right, to make a soft x-ray. So then the, the poster actually uh, it has a time series plot for uh, the chromosphere ge defined geometrically and the cor corona just defined geometrically within the red in uh, 1D uh, grid and the prediction of the continuum flux at 100 gigahertz, the thermal continuum, just the thermal continuum. And you can see actually that's quite striking. The foot point is bright. So uh, uh, that's even more striking in the context of what I have found uh, by looking through the whole spectrum and we can talk about that at the poster. So the conclusion of this is that we really can usefully study foot point sources in the free-free continuum right across the whole uh, electromagnetic spectrum from about 100 gigahertz up to the uh, 1.6 micron uh, cut, uh, cut on of the H minus opacity, which is a different mechanism completely. The best channel probably is the far infrared at 10 or 20 microns. Uh, so thank you. Um, can I start it or can you see my screen? Yes, please go ahead, Mariana. Okay, thank you. So thanks for the opportunity for the organizers. Uh, so this poster is dedicated to study the oscillatory behavior pattern of the horizontal and the vertical component of the magnetic helicity in the lower solar atmosphere. Uh, <clears throat> so the aim of this study is to reveal uh, different oscillatory behavior of the magnetic helicity in a flaring and a non-flaring active region cases. So therefore we constructed the magnetic field uh, structure of, uh, of eruptive and non-eruptive active region with potential field extrapolation. We use a potential field extrapolation because based on the master and also based on our study, uh, we found that the potential field extrapolation approach is uh, almost as good as the non-linear force free in our cases. So when we constructed uh, this magnetic field structure after we calculated the time series of the shearing emergence and the total magnetic helicity flux at every 360 kilometer height from the photosphere up to 3000 kilometer based on this equation. And after that, we analyzed the time series of this three helicity flux component with, with wavelet analysis. So uh, let's see one example, how is it looks like. Um, so the upper, uh, three panels showing the time series of the three helicity flux at different atmospheric height, namely at the photosphere, 700 kilometer above the photosphere and uh, 3000 kilometer above the photosphere. And this upper wavelet uh, analysis corresponding to the emerging uh, helicity flux uh, 
at different height, and the middle one is corresponding to the shearing helicity flux, and the bottom, we can uh, see the wavelet analysis of the total helicity flux. <clears throat> so, and this active region produces one uh, X class flare, which is highlighted with this uh, vertical black line. And if we look at the wavelet analysis of the three helicity flux component at the photospheric level, and also at 700 kilometer, we can see that uh, around the 20 hour period appear uh, before the flares uh, in the wavelet analysis of the three helicity flux component. However, the, at the 3000 kilometer, the emerging has a new period, which becoming the largest one at that time series at that height, while the shearing and the total one does, do not really change. So basically we did this uh, analysis uh, in 14 uh, eruptive and 10 non-eruptive active region cases, and we found that in the eruptive active region cases that the identified largest period of each helicity flux component are quasi similar. And this uh, largest and common period at the photospheric level, uh, remaining the largest and the common period of the three helicity flux component from the photosphere up to some height. The maximum height is uh, highlighted with this uh, color bar. While in the non eruptive active region cases, we found that the largest period of the emerging helicity flux at the photospheric level. The, uh, quite different compared to the shearing and the total one. So basically, based on this uh, two plot, we conclude that when the, hort when the horizontal and the vertical component uh, of the helicity flux oscillating with the same period from the photosphere up to some atmospheric height, uh, basically they are uh, becoming a coupled oscillatory system, then in this um, arrangement, the active region could be capable to release a large amount of uh, free energy from their system. Thank you very much. Dato, you're muted. Sorry. Yes, thank you, Mariana. Is there any question for Mariana? Okay. Next speaker is Abba Monka. Um, so please go ahead, Abba, if you are ready. We cannot hear you. Hello, can you hear yes. me now? Yes, we can hear now. Oh, thank you so much. So firstly, I would like to thank uh, to the organizers to allow me to present my work here. So I'm Abha Munga and uh, I would like to talk on the investigation of the solar photospheric magnetic parameters contributing to the post flare rotation. So basically, uh, currently, uh, this work is the part of the SolarNet uh, mobility program. And currently, I'm working with the Rahul Sharma, uh, Mariana courses, and the Robertus Italy. So basically, the motivation of uh, the talk uh, is the, uh, the, the uh, photosphere, uh, the sunspot get rotated uh, with the flaring activity. So basically, uh, in the case of the B et al, uh, 2016 and the Liu et al, they have observed the M class flare as well as the X class flare in which they found the uh, rotation of the sunspot after the flaring activity. So uh, in my case, I have uh, uh, analyzed the four cases, uh, which is related with the various flare magnitude, that is the X-class flare, M-class flare, C-class flare, as well as uh, with, from the B-class flare. So even for the C-class flare or the B-class flare, uh, I have found that uh, the rotation was very prominent after the flaring activity. Also, these uh, all these four cases are associated with the um, EUV waves. So uh, for, the wave, uh, for the EUV waves, so it is not necessary that uh, the flare should have the higher magnitude. However, uh, it is based on the magnetic topology of the active region. So for this study, I have used the data set from 
the sharp CEA uh, for their 12 minute cadence, as well as from the CGM Lawrence uh, for with the 12 minute cadence. So for this study, I have uh, identified the rotational parameters from the sharp data set. That is the mean cruise parameter, mean shear, and the mean helicity. However, the other parameters uh, suggested by Bobra uh, et al. 2015, uh, uh, she uh, she has suggested the poor parameter that is the total current helicity, vertical current helicity, photospheric free energy, and the Lorentz force are the poor parameter. For, uh, uh, I mean that may uh, trigger the uh, that actually helps uh, the various uh, sorry the large changes in these four parameters uh, may trigger the flare. So uh, I have uh, uh, studied the four flares, uh, X1.1 class flare, and that was observed on the uh, 8th of November, another 7.9. So basically they have the different magnetic topologies. That is the uh, X class flare has the beta gamma uh, delta complexity. Uh, uh, M and C class flares has the beta and gamma, uh, and the B 6.6 has the beta complexity. So in the various uh, uh, kind of the flares, uh, I have uh, uh, looked into the rotational parameters. So uh, along with the rotational parameters, I have uh, included the parameters suggested by Bobra. So uh, here I have uh, made the correlation matrices in which I have used the detrended data and the window size of uh, uh, the data is uh, uh, plus minus five hours. So, uh, here you can see that the lower uh, triangle, uh, here one is the diagonal here, and uh, the lower triangle uh, is the pre flare, and the upper triangle is the post flare. So, in the first, uh, the upper panel, uh, this is the uh, X class flare. So, in which uh, we can prominently see that the Lorentz force in Lorentz force with the total helicity initially has 0.91, and even after the flare, the correlation is 0.9. So, uh, it's 0.94 with the total helicity. So we can say that uh, these uh, flares are highly co uh, correlated. And even for the M class flare, you can see uh, here, uh, that is uh, 0.6 with the total helicity of the Lorentz oh, force. Stop, on... stop talking now. Yeah. This is finished now. Uh, just a minute. So uh, not only the uh, Lorentz force in the four cases, uh, the other parameters such as the mean twist and the photospheric free energy, uh, these are also correlated. So uh, in, not only in the case of the uh, X-class flare, even for the lower magnitude flares, these uh, parameters are highly correlated. So this work is currently in progress and I'm also uh, trying to figure out the uh, periods uh, associated with these parameters. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any quick question for Abha? We have two more posters and the next speaker is Jonas Binden. So please Jonas, go ahead. Okay, yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Good, okay. Um, so, yeah, my name is Jonas Spinton. I'm a PhD student at the University of Geneva, working together with uh, Lucia Kleint and Brandon Panos. And um, I want to advertise here now my poster about pre-processing solar spectra with a variational autoencoder to obtain the, uh, this is in the way, optimal data set for solar flare prediction. So our goal or the goal of our research in general is to train a neural network to distinguish between pre-flare active regions and non-flaring active regions. Um, and this was also attempted by Brandon Panos in our group already with magnesium spectra from IRIS. And I'm trying to extend that research to um, more lines and go a bit more in depth of what is possible. One problem that we're facing early on is that the majority of spectra in pre-flare and non-flaring active region observations are quite sun spectra and have not much predictive power. So we want to find an easy way to remove quite sun spectra from pre-flare and non-flaring active region observations. 
One way we can do this is by training a autoencoder, variational autoencoder on quiet sun spectra. So um, feeding in a quiet sun spectra, the autoencoder should from a low dimensional representation easily be able to reproduce it and have a low reconstruction error. Feeding in then um, a spectra that does not belong to quiet sun, the variational autoencoder should have more trouble reconstructing the spectra and the reconstruction error should be greater. And so it doesn't belong to the quiet sun um, observations or type of spectra, so we keep it. And like that, we can clean our data set for later um, training a neural network for flare prediction. Um, we can also uh, check this hypothesis about reconstruction error being related, high reconstruction error being related to um, more active regions uh, on, in an observation of iris by overplotting a slit jaw image uh, with color coded uh, bins for different reconstruction error, where we can see here in yellow with the highest reconstruction error being around where the flare emerges. And so now, if you would like to learn more about how, how variational autoencoders work and how we can use them in uh, solar physics, um, visit me in Wonder Me, um, and we can discuss uh, my poster there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jonas. Yeah, we don't have time uh, now for questions, uh, and we can do it during lunchtime. So our next um, presenter is Alex Pietrov. Uh, Alex, please. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Can you also see the title? Yes. Okay. So uh, my name is Alex Pietrov. I'm a PhD student from Stockholm University, and I'm here to talk about uh, my latest paper that got accepted somewhere uh, this month. And it's about the physical properties of a fan jet that was backlit by a flare. So what we've been using for this project is this uh, famous X9.3 flare that we've seen come by in a few other talks already. And what we noticed when we were looking at it is that uh, over here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but in the circled area, you can see a little uh, peacock jet or fan jet, which is uh, yeah, standing above a uh, light bridge in the sunspot below. And what we can see is that uh, when the flare ribbon is expanding, it's actually going underneath the jet and it's suppressing uh, whatever is underneath, but, uh, which causes it to uh, collapse. And this is very interesting because we now have a jet that is collapsing. So most of the material is moving in one direction. And it's also backlit by this uh, very bright flare ribbon, which uh, oh, uh, if we look at the spectra in a second, uh, you will see is a very nice way to model it. So here we see a uh, cartoon of a sideways view of the situation, how we imagine it to be. Uh, we have the chromosphere with the fan jet over here, and in the back we have the flare ribbon, and our line of sight is something like that, uh, which is why we uh, have the backlit uh, fan jet. Now, if we look at the spectra uh, around and in this jet, we see that the flare ribbon, uh, which is marked here by the red dot, has very uh, yeah, broadened profiles, which seem almost flat, like continuum-like uh, in the window of the SST. And the profiles inside the fan are uh, these nice sort of Gaussian shapes, which get broader and flattened out the deeper you go into the fan. Uh, when we looked at this, it reminded us of this kind of simple rate of transfer example, where you take continuum as a backlight uh, for a cloud. And we actually modeled the fan in this way uh, by assuming that this is a, a flat continuum. And we made a cloud model that uh, yeah, then simulated or uh, modeled the fan. And from this, we got some uh, nice results, which allowed us to actually um, get the mass loss and the density of the fan. And also uh, using the Stockholm inversion code, we were able to get the temperature and uh, some other parameters, uh, which were further explained in the paper and the poster, which you can look at uh, after this talk. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Alex. Right. Um, thanks again to all speakers for uh, excellent talks. So now we have lunch time, and uh, I think Lynn's Day wants to announce about lunchtime plan. Uh, yes, I hope everyone can see the screen that I'm sharing now. Yes, we can okay. see the screen.
Thank you. So we're trying an experiment. Uh, the RAS has uh, subscribed to a new um, facility called uh, wonder.me. And we have set up uh, a space for this, this meeting. And here is the, um, uh, the tiny URL for it. And the password is very simple. It's hello with a capital H. Um, so this is, it's like gather town, but it has a kind of smoother interface. Doesn't work with Safari, unfortunately. So you've got to have Chrome running if you have a Mac. Um, each of the five posters has got an area associated with it identified by the presenter name. If you want to speak to the presenter, you move to the area and you join a bubble. If you get close enough, it forms a kind of bubble. And if you see a bubble, you can leap into it. Each bubble can host up to 14 people and uh, anyone speaking inside that bubble can be heard by anyone within the bubble. Now, it's, it's, not, it's, it's a fun platform, but unfortunately it's not like Gather Town in that you cannot post things there permanently. So the presenter will have to share their screen and talk you through their, their uh, poster. That's kind of a downside, but I hope we can um, work with that. Um, because, you know, both the presenters probably also want to go and get some lunch sometimes. We have got this uh, uh, repository. All the posters are available at this repository here. Um, I'm going to leave this uh, slide up during lunchtime. So if you go away and come back, uh, you'll be able to, to see all the information. The one thing to remember, please, if you are... Um, if you have Zoom open and you have Wonder Me open at the same time, please make sure that your only your your, your um, microphone is muted in one of them because otherwise we will get terrible terrible echoes. So if you're into, going into Wonder Me, then please make sure they're muted in Zoom. Um, and I just spotted that somebody had a a question, I think, or maybe not. LinkedIn. May I suggest just copy the first link or both links on chat? I will do that. That's a very good point. Thank you. So this Thank is you. one. Of Thanks very much, Paolo. That's an obvious thing to, to do. So I'll do that right now, everyone. So uh, wonder.me at um, here. OK, and uh, poster PDFs will be here. I can see people entering the room right now. There's people wandering about in there. Um, okay, so there we are. Um, so I guess that's it for lunchtime and we're back at um, uh, 1.45. Okay, everybody, uh, welcome back. Um, to the afternoon session of this uh, meeting on the 3D structure of the flare chromosphere. And so I'm very pleased um, to welcome all the way from uh, Montana, where I don't know what time it is in the morning, but probably very early. And Professor uh, Zhong Chu is going to give us an invited talk on the fine scale structure and dynamics of flare ribbons in the lower atmosphere. So thank you, John. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. Yeah, it's 6.45 a.m. in Montana time. So yeah, thank you for uh, getting me here to see everybody and talk about the uh, flare chromosphere. That's my favorite subject. Uh, okay, so the, uh, the, there's a lot of things we can say about the, uh, the flare ribbons in the low atmosphere for but then for today, I try to focus on just two things. The, uh, the, the first one is what, what the uh, SDO and iris observation can tell us about the uh, evolution structure of the uh, recognition energy release that can be mapped by the uh, flare ribbons and across different scales. And second, I also wish to again go over this uh, old topic of uh, that, that keeps progressing. That is the uh, low atmosphere. Apparently, uh, observations provide the diagnostics of uh, flare energetics and uh, uh, specifically the characters uh, of uh, heating, right? When and where, by how much, for how long, and uh, uh, through what mechanism and flare atmosphere can be heated. Uh, so to start the story, uh, this is the uh, movie, fantastic movie by ARA, I wish to share again and again. So showing the uh, flares in different wavelengths. So this movie is taken in UV 171 wavelengths. But what, what I wish to point out is the, uh, of course, the flare ribbons we're all familiar with, right? And uh, that is 
brightened and at the beginning of the flare and then followed by the post flare loops and uh, 10 or 20 minutes later and then the uh, uh then in this movie something special uh, is the uh or what we call dark ribbons right you see the uh the, the dimming, what we call the coronal dimming, and the, uh, spreading along the uh, extending from the major flare region. So basically, uh, both of the features, bright or dark, those are the places where we believe nowadays we believe the uh, where the uh, reconnection takes place, and then the that's the 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 boundary between the. Uh, open and closed field lines, and then the, the, the ribbons where the dark or bright just map the separatures in the corona and uh, that, 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 that are inter intercepting with the uh, low atmosphere. So that is cool. So the ribbons allow us to see the magnetic energy release re event. So the, uh, uh, this event, I believe, had been studied by the, the Dudik and, and also modeled by uh, a lot of people. So again, I remapped the flare ribbons in the red and in time sequence starting from the dark all the way to the white, but also the, uh, the dimming ribbons and uh, mapped in the blue color and the, uh, the time sequence of the, the, the brightening and the dimming. And then the, uh, we can compare this structure with the, uh, the modeled separatists or Q map. So in the lower right, you can see the, uh, basically uh, the flare ribbons, as I said, usually map the topological boundary and between the uh, open and closed field lines. So that, that has become a com commonly accepted fact, right? So there's no doubt about that. But apparently in the past 10 years, we we have learned a lot more details about flare ribbons. So here's the, uh, 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 in the top left, just uh, again, a snapshot of uh, the flare ribbons observed by AIA, uh, particularly about this flare. And, uh, M7.3, and a lot of people have studied this flare. So then uh, in the right, again, uh, that's just a mapping of the flare ribbon. And as time goes on from blue to red, you can see the, the, the ribbons are spread across the uh, lower atmosphere, right? And in the direction more or less perpendicular to the plate inversion line. So that, that, that is something we have known for a long time. But this flare is also observed by the iris with a high resolution by three or four times. Uh, uh, so, uh, so in the lower left panel, I uh, just show a few snapshots of the flare observed in the slit jar images by iris to and pass the 1800, that is a little bit low atmosphere, and also 1400, that's the uh, transition region. And you can see the, the flare ribbons and uh, in the color scale. And uh, what I want to focus on here is the, uh, what, what we call the leading edge of flare ribbons or the ribbon fronts. That, that, uh, those are the newly brightened pixels. And uh, at the very uh, start or out edge of flare ribbons as the ribbon spread out from the, uh, the upper left to the lower right. So that's the direction of the ribbon spread. And then if we map this, what we call the leading edge or the ribbon front and as a time sequence, so the, the the, the lower right just shows us mapping and the co color here just shows the time, right? And the, as the, the ribbons start to form and uh, then in the blue color, so then as time goes on and the ribbon just spread to the right and with uh, the color turning into the warm colors. So here I only sample a small part of the flare ribbon. So as indicated in this red box. So it, it's interesting and from this mapping and uh, we can see the, uh, I think there are two things I can say. So uh, first, uh, uh, more or less on a global scale, and in this case, uh, 10 to 20 megameter scale. So we can see the ribbon front still form kind of a curved line, right? So we say still globally, the flare energy release is laminar. So on what scale? Uh, at what scale? But then you can see the fine structure, right? So it, it's kind of zigzagged. And also some places you see somehow the ribbon front is thicker than other places. So the it, it's clear the uh, flare reconnection is highly structured. So uh, this is a study uh, made by uh, Stephen Moss uh, just uh, recently. 
and uh, then uh, uh, of course we want to ask what determines structure and uh, the uh, uh, it's likely if you look at the river mapped in the photosphere and mentograms so uh, the uh, the photospheric magnetic field shows a highly degree uh, the high degree of a structure so it's likely the river structure partly reflects the structure of the lower atmosphere magnetic field distribution uh, probably uh, that's not all the story. So I, I wish to take a discourse to show some of the high resolution MHD simulations about flare ribbons. So uh, this is the uh, recent simulation by uh, Darling uh, with the uh, high resolution, uh, 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 very high resolution uh, MHD scale. So uh, in the top left, the simulation starts with just a very idealized uh, bipolar and with a smooth distribution of magnetic field in the photosphere. So then in the corona, you see as the reconnection goes on, the, uh, the uh, reconnection in the corona becomes somewhat turbulent. Of course, it's still MHD scale turbulence. And uh, Joe is able to just map down the field lines or the reconnecting field lines in the uh, chronosphere in the lower boundary. So the uh, in the right, and he showed the uh, kind of a ribbon structure and evolving from the beginning of the flare all the way to the end. So you can see more or less the resolution, even though in the ideal situation, can uh, reproduce the evolution of the flare ribbons starting from close to the plate inversion line spreading out, right? But the interesting thing is the, uh, even though the boundary at the boundary magnetic field distribution is kind of more or less just smooth and it does develop this uh, structure and the high uh, the fine scale structure uh, like this what we call as the, the, the walls right and uh, somewhat representing the structure we see in the observation so that, that basically said that uh, what we see in the observation the high structure the highly structured uh, uh, pattern of uh, the uh, flare ribbon may actually also reflect something in the corona, but to what extent we, it's still uh, ongoing research, we, we, we don't quite know. So it, it's important to have uh, somewhat high resolution magnetic field observation in the transition region of chromosphere to help us to further probe this question. But uh, going back to the uh, observation itself, so the, I, I just showed you, we are able to reproduce the pattern of the leading edge of flare ribbons. So in, uh, then Stephen North just went ahead to do some interesting measurement. Uh, if we just go back to actually uh, see the thickness of the ribbon front. So along uh, each of the strips of the ribbon. So here in this figure, and uh, he uh, represents the, in this figure, the color now just uh, uh, represents the uh, thickness of the ribbon. So warm color shows the ribbon is thicker and compared with the cold color when the ribbon is uh, thin, okay. Uh, again, here is just a newly brightened ribbon front, so not the entire ribbon, but the, uh, the newly brightened leading edge of the flare ribbon. So uh, again, this uh, pattern, what we call the zebra plot, shows a distribution. It's actually a, a spatial and a time distribution of uh, the leading edge, right? The time is represented by the progressing from the upper all the way to, uh, to the lower part of the uh, uh, in, in the field view. And then the, uh, uh, then you can see again, we, we get this linear structure and at each time, but also uh, at places that the ribbon uh, front is a second. So uh, the, in terms of a scale, so that translates to about two iris scale pixels uh, up to 10 iris pixels, or that's 200 to 1200 kilometers. But of course, the, uh, that, that is subject to the time cadence and uh, that, that he, each ribbon front is uh, captured and with a cadence about uh, 30 seconds. And uh, then uh, what, what does this tell us? Well, uh, if you look at the uh, distribution of the ribbon front, right? So apparently those warm color or bright places uh, is located at where the ribbons seem to move faster. So naturally we can interpret it as just uh, the ribbon front shows where the, the ribbon actually moves faster. So if we, again, and uh, take into account the time cadence, that, that's probably uh, 40 kilometers per second. 
So, uh, but, uh, again, this pattern actually shows a, a very good mapping of the structure of uh, reconnection dynamics just to, uh, in the lower atmosphere. And uh, then uh, to compare with uh, some other studies or some other observations, so here we uh, just try run a uh, time distance plot along a few places like uh, S1, S2, and S3. So the uh, top panel in the right just shows us mapping. And uh, then along the S1, S2, and S3, and from left to right. So the, uh, uh, the interesting thing we can see here is the uh, river front seems to be uh, enhanced. Okay, the sickness is enhanced. Whenever we see some enhanced uh, uh, emission in the hard X-ray. Of course, the hard X-ray is observed by uh, FEMI in this case, and uh, with, with no spatial resolution. So that, that study, uh, uh, we, we, we cannot really map the hard X-ray uh, uh, to such a precision as we can see by iris. But this uh, time correlation uh, is very interesting. It shows that uh, the ribbon front is enhanced uh, somewhere uh, just about half a minute or one minute before we see the burst in hard X-ray. That's kind of intriguing. And uh, then the, uh, uh, we can map this back to just to, uh, uh, it's a different representation. Again, just shows the, uh, at different places when the ribbon front, the thickness is enhanced and uh, right off that we see the hard X-ray burst. And uh, uh, that, that certainly just poses a question, exactly what we see in the ribbon front, what causes this, uh, the sickness or enhanced uh, broadening in the ribbon front. So the, in the right-hand side, I, I try to compare with the, uh, what was done before, for example, by uh, Sam Crocker and uh, Lindsay and uh, uh, the, it's just uh, the now uh, the velocity of the brightest features. So it seems that when we look at the velocity of the brightest features, they're more or less uh, simultaneous with the hard degree burst. But the, the leading edge, the velocity of the leading edge somehow is ahead of the hard degree burst by about half to one minute. So that, that uh, uh, somehow this is a study has some similarity to some, some other recent studies by, for example, Yan Shi and uh, the, uh, the Jeffrey. And uh, I, I'm going to just show the, uh, those other studies. So here's the, uh, um, uh, I think Yan Shi's uh, recent paper published in 2016, but in somewhat different context. So in this study, uh, Yan Shi showed the, uh, again, the flare ribbon front. So those top panels show the evolution of flare ribbon uh, at four times during the evolution of a flare. But what is interesting is this edge, the dark edge, and in this helium 10A30, so it's dark rather than bright, okay? And then this dark edge has a spatial scale about half to one millimeter. And then the cadence of this image is, is about 20 to 30 seconds. So uh, again, if we think about the uh, comparison with the uh, earlier study by the uh, by Stephen North, so uh, the, the time and spatial scale is somewhat similar, even though it's a totally different kind of observation. Okay, so uh, the lower panel here just shows the, uh, uh, again, the, uh, the spatial scale of this dark edge. Uh, as I said, it's about uh, a half to one megameter. And then the, uh, uh, the lower panel shows actually the time evolution of uh, uh, how long it takes for this dark, uh, uh, absorption uh, feature, uh, how, how long turns, how, how long it takes to turn into the bright? It's it's about the uh, it's about a couple of minutes. Okay, so then uh, this flare uh, that uh, shared by Yan Shi and observed by GST with a much higher resolution, and it's also observed by Iris. So the uh, Iris uh, uh, here the. Uh, top right panel shows the uh, line profile uh, for uh, iris obtained in magnesium line. So it, it turns out that uh, at this uh, negative ribbon front, so the, the line profile shows us what we call the central reversal, right? At the center, there's a dip, but then the enhanced emission at the wing. 
So what, what can possibly produce a stark edge or absorption in the helium line? So the, the proposal is uh, maybe there's a small amount of uh, non-thermal uh, the electrons and the causing the ionization, but then uh, then that causes the uh, absorption in the helium line. So then uh, very recently, the, the Graham Kerr run a uh, numeric simulation try to reproduce the uh, the absorption uh, in this line, and then the uh, in that sense, I, I think Kerr could uh, confirm that uh, it's it, it is most likely caused by. Uh, or what is proposed, a small amount of electrons at the leading edge and followed by the emission later on. But then what, what cannot be produced in the model is somehow the uh, the absorption lasted for uh, uh, at least a minute, but then that cannot be produced in the observation. So it's still a little bit of mystery what, what causes the uh, leading edge, okay, the, the, the feature at that time and spatial scale. Uh, I also wish to uh, go over uh, another uh, study by uh, uh, somewhat related, but again, a uh, uh, different context. So that, that, that is by the Nat uh, Natasha Jeffrey and just a couple of years ago. Now this observation is made by Iris with a very high time resolution now, and it's two seconds, uh, that, that is order of magnitude higher resolution than the two observations I just showed earlier. So the iris caught a B-class flare, and here the, the slit crossed the uh, ribbon of just two arc second uh, the width. Uh, what is interesting study is again this, uh, the leading edge or the just uh, the, the the precursor, somewhat somewhat the precursor phase of uh, before the brightening or peak emission in this flare ribbon. So the uh, Natasha showed this uh, non-thermal uh, width enhancement. Again, it's about 20 seconds before the brightening the, the uh, in the silicon line. So uh, the interpretation of this one by Natasha and, and uh, Fletcher et al. is the, uh, that there might be some turbulence detected and at a scale, the uh, 20 or 30 seconds before the UV and hard X-ray peak emission. So uh, also the interesting, uh, with that high resolution, so the uh, Natasha can see the pulsation of this non-thermal uh, 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 broadening so in, in this line. And uh, the, those observations pose an interesting question and about the leading edge of flare ribbons just before the, the enhanced uh, emission. So uh, I guess the uh, still studies can go on and to, to find out the, the magnets producing those features, I shall. And uh, now, now I, I wish to change gear now since we touched the topic about the heating magnetism that produce the, uh, the leading edge brightening. And uh, uh, okay, so uh, uh, to go that, I think I wish to uh, go back to the AIA and observation and uh, the about the uh, flare ribbon observation. Now I try to relate this observation to the corona signatures. Again, here is the uh, uh, AI observation of uh, flare ribbons, right? And uh, in 10 different wavelengths. So in the low atmosphere, the 1600, uh, the UV emission showing the ribbons, but later on the 10 minutes or 20 minutes later, you start to see the, the flare loop brightening in different wavelengths and going all the way from 10 million Kelvin degree to 1 million Kelvin degree in a time sequence from the hot line all the way to cool line and basically shows the, uh, the cooling uh, sequence. And here, uh, what I show is the uh, actually the light curve or, or the time profile uh, of one AI pixel, okay, from the foot point to the loop top. So the uh, apparently the well, we, we know that for a long time, the, the brighter in the foot point or in the low atmosphere takes place much earlier and much more impulsive, right? Then we can see the brightening in the loop top. So because of that, so a while ago, so we thought about we can use the uh, foot point light curve that can be resolved uh, in the low atmosphere to try to mimic the heating process, the energy lease, okay, and use that as a proxy for heating to heat the corona. So that, that basically uh, is kind of a practice of uh, the uh, new party factor, only that here we don't use hard x-ray because we cannot spatially resolve the hard x-ray observation, but UV we can resolve the heating very well in the one uh, up to one arc second. And then the, uh, uh, so uh, this is the uh, practice we, we 
have, have done in the past few years using the resolved foot point heating to heat the corona. And uh, uh, then when we do that, we can come up with uh, thousands of heating events because of the thousands of uh, foot point brightening and then add them up. And then we get the, uh, we can synthesize uh, what is happening in the corona. So in the right panel, we show the uh, um, basically time sequence of uh, the heating, but now just uh, uh, summed up to represent the total emission in the corona. For example, from the top, those are the ghost emission and uh, at the two channels and then the uh, markdown and, uh, and, and followed by the UV emission in all those UV channels. So that turns out to be a quite successful practice with a very few parameters because most of the, most of the other parameters for the heating actually uh, are constrained by the food point brightening that we can obtain from the observations. And uh, uh, here is the uh, just uh, uh, some examples, and uh, when we try to uh, uh, use the same, uh, uh, apply the same method to model flares, uh, several other flares. So again, uh, those just uh, uh, three different flares, and we show the that that kind of new UV Newport effect, use that effect to do the corona heating, and observed then, then reproduce the uh, uh, the. Uh, emission as seen by ghosts and by some other AI channels. And then from there, we actually can get the, uh, the heating energy and uh, that we can infer from the uh, UV light curve. So the right panel just shows the uh, each each point just show one pixel, one heating event, we can infer from the UV light curve. So it kind of scaled with the uh, 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 1600 emission and uh, to some simple nice power and uh, uh, exactly what, what should be the power index is still uh, ongoing research. Uh, but uh, on gl global scale is kind of a success. We can get some first order flare energetics. And uh, of course, there's a lot of questions can be asked, right? So for example, uh, we, we use the light curve. Uh -huh. Two minutes left. Okay, sure. So, but then the uh, the the question is whether it's uh, uh, the 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 AI observation just give us uh, twenty four seconds, right? And also the time the spatial resolution is not as good, and we don't know the the spectral content of uh, the UV photometry, and also this practice doesn't tell you the what heating mechanism is there. So the uh, but uh, in the next two slides, I'm just going to show the. The similar practice can be done with iris, but with uh, much better spatial resolution and uh, much better time resolution, but also more importantly with uh, spectral information. So here's the uh, uh, the event that is uh, th that that must be very familiar to a lot of us now by Graham and Gaussian and showing us the proto typical elementary bursts with the uh, spectral information and also with the uh, very high time resolution by iris and uh, uh, spatial resolution as well. So uh, a lot of effort has been put into uh, trying to reproduce the, the downflow and uh, uh, in the uh, cool line and uh, of course the uh, upflow in the hot line. So here's the, uh, it's a very busy plot, but it's just a recapture of the observation. And uh, then the model now is constrained by the uh, observation, for example, the hard X-ray observation, but then the, the energy is uh, uh, distributed into each of the single pixels, right? Guided by the light curve in the iris, the uh, sleeve observation. So the, the top panel just show uh, some reproduction of the uh, downflows. And uh, it's more or less a successful comparison with the uh, observed and the downflow. And uh, in the right panel is the, the by the curl and show the upflow. Okay, so then uh, again trying to reproduce the the apple curl, uh, plot by the uh, uh, shown by in the observation. So uh, there is some success in the such a practice, but also it seems that there's a one thing missing in the model. The model cannot produce the uh, the time scale. Okay, that that is uh, for example here the upflow shows the uh, uh, Doppler shift uh, lasting for a few minutes, but the model can only reproduce uh, one or two minutes. So that, that is still a mystery. So uh, we, we don't know what produces additional heating and what's the heating mechanism. 
Okay, so uh, uh, I think I I will just wrap up. So <laughs> to give a summary, what, what we have seen. So uh, uh, we, we can see the retention energy release is a global organized, but also highly structured. But then there, there are a lot of questions we can ask. What, what determine the fine scale structure of flare ribbons and what's the nature of the pre precursor uh, photometry and the dynamics at the leading edge of flare ribbons? I think it's uh, still a mystery. And uh, then uh, again, the next order, right now we see the elementary scale, right? And uh, uh, by IRIS and uh, GST of 100 kilometers. But if we move down to 10 kilometers, for example, what do we expect to see at a uh, uh, given scale? And what new physics can we learn? And uh, the other things, again, about the uh, energetics. So uh, I, the electron heating is popular, but we, we, we see, uh, we still don't know whether electron heating is ubiquitous, and especially uh, in the last slide, I show the the long-lasting heating, and uh, we, we don't know what uh, produces that, and uh, whether we should in in uh, kind of uh, invoke other heating mechanisms to kind of uh, reproduce or explain the what, what what we see in the spectroscopy observations in UV and uh, optical, and as uh, just to. Uh, reviewed by the IRIS and GST. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, John. Uh, very comprehensive talk. Um, so we have time for a couple of questions, I guess, maybe one or two. If somebody wants to, I see Hugh's got his hand up. I'm going to wait if somebody else has got their hand up. Right, okay. Sorry, Hugh. Christoph's going to get the first go because you're always asking questions. You can put questions in the Q&A. Um, so Christoph, let me unmute you and... I think I can unmute you. Well, you can unmute yourself, Crystal. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, actually, I did not raise my hand. Sorry, I just clicked on the wrong thing. But but I do have a question. Uh, uh -huh. um, it's about this dark ribbon front and helium. Uh, is there a bit? I mean, this is information from the um, from imaging. Just um, do you know if there's some some also spectra which have been analyzed in this respect uh, of these dark ribbons? Uh, I uh, I think uh, you're right. The uh, right this is the image, right? So in the helium ten A thirty, I think uh, from this observation alone, and uh, uh, the uh, spectra uh, were obtained by Iris in one of the two flares uh, illustrated in this paper. So uh, this is actually the spectra, the magnesium line, magnesium line. I, I think also there's a carbon two line. And show the, uh, the the profile at the dark edge, right? So it, it's basically what I said: the, the centrally reversed profile compared with the uh, uh, basically just a, a, a profile from the the emission region, the the bright region. So the bright region show a profile that is different from the uh, profile in uh, at the dark edge. So th this is actually the profile they showed in the paper. Yeah. And then the, those profiles are kind of synthesized by the, uh, the <coughs> in, in his recent paper. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so if there are more questions in the interest of time, I'm going to ask people to put them in the, the Q&A so that John can uh, look at them and answer them in, in uh, her own time. Uh, and in that case, thank you again, John. Uh, and we will move on to the next talk, which is by Yaro Dudik. Would you like to go ahead and share your screen? Yeah, hello everyone. Do you hear me? Do you see my screen? Yes, thank you, Yaro. Okay, so I would like to thank uh, the organizers for giving me uh, this opportunity to talk about uh, solar flare arcades, uh, which, as I will try to convince you, are saddle shaped. And uh, of course, this is not only about the arcades, it's about the, it's about the underlying ribbons as well. And uh, this is work uh, that's been headed by my former PhD student, Juraj Lorinczyk, who is now uh, at Lockheed uh, and was also done in collaboration with Guillaume Olanya. So this is the gist of my, uh, of my talk. Uh, here you see five uh, solar flares. They range uh, from mid C class to M class to, to large X class flares, which are here on the right. And in a sense, they all look the same in a sense that the flare arcade looks like a saddle. 
uh, at the uh, far extremities of the arcade, you see these uh, these flare loops, which are locally higher than the middle of uh, of the arcade, and this creates uh, an appearance of saddles, as you can see here on the on these cartoons. Uh, and this uh, happens irrespective of you know whether it's a C class or or an X class, uh, and almost irrespective of uh, what is the underlying magnetic environment. And uh, as I said, this saddle-like appearance is due to these uh, uh, loops at the edge, which we call cantle loops. Uh, this comes from a terminology of, uh, of the horseback riding. And uh, so I will try to explain how these, uh, how these cantle loops uh, come uh, in existence. So uh, this is one of the flares that's a C5.4. Uh, it's one of the flares that's been famous for the occurrence of super arcades. You can see super arcade uh, late, later on in the event here. But uh, from the imagery, you can see that uh, the saddle uh, is spatially related to this erupting hot channel. Somehow this hot channel has the foot points in roughly the same places where we see uh, these uh, these loops. And also you see the, uh, the overlying coronas, uh, for example, in 171. Here there's a lot of, uh, lot of coronal loops here that uh, later disappear. And we see this uh, when the flare arcade starts to cool down. We see this uh, candle loop also in uh, in 171. And uh, we picked this flare because it was quite early. I think this was 2011 May. And uh, for this flare, we also have the stereo data, which uh, stereo B sees this flare as an on disk event. And you can see the ribbons here. There's a pair of rib uh, of what we call hooked ribbons. And uh, so a hook ribbon typically has a rather straight part, which then uh, switches into, into this curved hooked part. And the sudden ribbon again has this uh, has this uh, hooked shape. And uh, as you can see, the cantle loop, which is at the very uh, very edge uh, here, comes uh, from this place noted uh, with the red uh, with the red uh, circle. So you can follow the evolution of, of this uh, place of the red circle. And you see that at the start of the flare, you are located inside of this uh, hooked ribbon. And then later on, as, as the ribbon evolves, this place uh, is outside the ribbon and corresponds to a, to a flare loop. And of course, uh, here you see the, the coronal loops that, uh, gets pro that they get progressively eaten, uh, eaten by this ribbon. So they, you know, this tells you that somehow they should participate in the reconnection. Now, all the, here all these loops, uh, all, almost all of them disappeared. So uh, these are the other events which we picked uh, for study. These are the ones that the X-Class flares from 2017 uh, September. This is from the September 6th and from the September 10th. So it's the same active region. And we see that again uh, in composite images, uh, you have these longer cantle loops in chrono filters and in red, you see a rather large uh, one three one uh, emission. So the famous 2017 September 10 flare also shows this morphology. Most of the studies have concentrated on this northern part, but there's also a huge flare arcade going, you know, uh, uh, going hundreds of arc seconds down here. And you can see the cantaloupes are quite pronounced uh, in here. And uh, again, the cantle is in the same place where at the start of the flare, you see this, uh, this hot red uh, flux rope. So this uh, also should be uh, related not only to the chrono loops, which disappear here, but also to, to the flux rope. And finally, uh, the last two flares, this, uh, this one on the top is the 2011 7th June filament eruption. And here you again see uh, on disk these uh, hooked uh, ribbons. And the last flare, I uh, think we taken from a paper by Professor Q. Uh, you see uh, here an arcade of, uh, of flare loops, and then you see some very long flare loops going, you know, going hundreds of arc seconds in here. And uh, you also see these hooked uh, ribbons that go uh, 
that go from here all the way back here and there's a pronounced hook here uh, as well. And uh, here I'm going to make a detour uh, regarding these uh, candle loops and, and the ribbons because uh, sometimes, especially in smaller flares, this is a, this is a C5 flare. You see the ribbons in 1600, but uh, you know it's not the whole story. Uh, a better way to see the ribbons is uh, it's a simple trick. Take a ratio of 1600 to 1700, and you uh, you see the ribbons much more clearly stand out uh, against all these uh, these plages. Uh, and this ratio is also a good proxy for any sort of brightenings in the transition region. So you see something in here. And uh, one downside is that the, the sunspots will also show to be uh, quite bright here. Of course, in 304, you see the ribbons much more clearly. You also see these, uh, these dark ribbons, which uh, if we go to back to an earlier time, uh, they are related to these hooked uh, portions of, of the ribbons. And uh, for me, these are simply coronal dimming regions. So uh, to, to explain where these uh, cantaloupes loops at the edges of the saddles uh, come, uh, we have to talk about uh, modeling uh, of eruptive flares. So here uh, I'm showing images from uh, Guillaume Olagne's model. Here you see the flux rope core in, in pink. And then you have a lot of overlying arcades, which are shown either in green, these are the more vertical ones, or the more peripheral uh, ones are shown here in the orange. And the distinction between green and orange here uh, is made in such a way is that the, these green arcades, they undergo the standard flare reconnection of the omega. Once the eruption is in progress, the, these become omega shaped and they reconnect below the flux rope. They create the, all, all these uh, green uh, flare loops. But the orange ones, uh, they also reconnect and they reconnect uh, in a way that they become part of, uh, of the flux rope. So here you see that these, uh, these chrome loops turned into something highly twisted. And uh, as the flare ribbons, uh, which you see on this bottom panel, they move uh, away, the straight, part move, the straight parts move away, and this eats into the flux rope. So the pink flux rope uh, is eaten from the inside and uh, a portion of it also turns to these, uh, to these uh, flare loops. And uh, please, this has all sorts of con consequences, uh, namely that the flux rope foot points inside these hooks, uh, they drift during the eruption. It also means that the flux rope you will see somewhere in the interplanetary space is not the same flux rope that left the sun during the eruption. And it also means that these flare loops, uh, these pink flare loops here, uh, perhaps had, an, had a different initial atmosphere if you try to model the heating. If this eruption was that of a filament, then uh, here you are supposed to be heating uh, you know, a much denser atmosphere than you know, for, the, for the green ones. And uh, here uh, I'm showing the detailed evolution of the ribbons at three different times. So in the model first, uh, the, the ribbon hook is uh, shown by blue, then at a later time is uh, shown by green, and at the end of the simulation is shown by red. So uh, the straight parts of the ribbons, they simply move away from the polarity inversion line, which is this uh, yellow, uh, yellow line. But the hooks, they first expand. So we go from blue to green here, and later on they contract. So uh, a particular foot point or a particular field line shown here by the orange circle, first is outside of the flux rope, then at the green time is inside of the, uh, inside of the, uh, in the flux rope, and later on it leaves it uh, again. So it should become a flare loop. And we see the same thing happening in observation. So this, uh, here are three snapshots from the 2014 uh, September 10 flare. At the beginning of the flare, you see the ribbon is rather weak. Uh, then this hook expands here. So there is some area that, uh, that enters into the hook. And later on, this, uh, the hook uh, starts to shrink. So again, this area leaves, uh, leaves the hook. So any field lines that were rooted in here are supposed to reconnect at least two times. 
now we uh, now we go to the anatomy of these reconnections between the inclined arcades and the flux rope. So here is a. a Garo, thing. can I ask you to wrap up, please? You're clicking now for. Uh, Okay, uh, so I told you that uh, you know this reconnection uh, happens sometimes uh, many times. Here the, uh, is a simulation of Gianketo where they see some location to reconnect up to four times. So this thing happens also in different models. And finally, uh, this type of arcade to rope reconnection is what creates these uh, these cantles at the edges uh, of uh, of the solar flares of the solar flare saddles, and this tells you uh, uh, roughly just by eye, you know how what is the portion of the flare volume that uh, is created by this reconnection of the flux rope, and I think that's my main message. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yaro. Um, I'm sorry if I hurried you there. I might have got the timing wrong. I do beg your pardon. Um, but we have time now for a couple of questions. Um, so please raise your hand or put something in the Q&A if you have questions. I have a question. Um, and that's, um, I wonder whether in the observations you associate, there's any association between the saddle points uh, or the saddle location and these super arcade downflows. Have you looked at that? Uh, I shouldn't say anything because I'm working on that now. And uh, basically, uh, for me, uh, for the super arcade downflows, we first would need to understand what is the super arcade. Mm. You know, because that's the really hot emission that you see in Iron 21 and sometimes in Iron 24 in AIA. And then uh, there are all these dark downflows, which uh, somehow uh, flow down faster than other closing fields. So there should be something creating a vertical differential in the retraction of flare loops. And uh, we are not yet in agreement of uh, what it is. I have some ideas relating to this uh, 3D geometry. Guillaume Melania would say you that it doesn't matter, you know, what reconnects, whether it's the corona or the flux rope or whatever, everything late in the flare is, is, is highly stretched. So we don't know yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions? Uh, yes, Julius. Uh, you should be able to talk if you unmute, Julius. Yes. Uh, Jana, do you think that this uh, characteristic saddle-shaped uh, uh, saddle uh, uh, flare loops are a consequence of some more general complex large-scale structure of coronal fields above or might be it due to some configuration of active regions uh, underlying uh, this uh, flare loops system? Uh Good question. I would say that this uh, simply comes from how the active regions are structured because, you know, they have these peripheral grown loops at, at both ends. And uh, the flux rope comes into being by shearing and cancellation motions and, of course, has to end at the sun somewhere. And these points where it ends at the sun are still going to be in the active region simply because you know the flux has to has to come uh, from somewhere. So uh, this model has just two polarities: is a simple bipolar active region that is evolving to create the flux rope. So uh, this this should be all pretty generic. Which is uh, which to me is the reason why the saddles then should be generic. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Yaro. And uh, we've all learned a new word today, which is cantle. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So the next talk is by Christoph Kukai. So Yaro, if you could stop sharing and let Christoph mm -hmm. share. Thank you. Okay, that should be in presentation mode now, right? Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, Christoph. Yeah, so first of all, thanks a lot for giving me the chance here to present this work, um, this ongoing work, I would say, and uh, it has been uh, on hold for, I would say, a few years, and uh, 
Now, I restarted it uh, um, since I'm at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias. Um, so um, I'm going to just show a little bit what has been done so far, and um, hopefully this is um, also giving some, some interesting clues about what is happening in the chromosphere here during this flare. Um, so um, I just start directly uh, mentioning the data, and this is uh, the flare occurred in 2013, May 17. It's an M32 flare, which occurred in this active region, 11748. Um, you see here in the magnetogram, um, this is a quite compact active region. Uh, it has uh, sunspots, it has filaments, um, it, of course, a prior inversion line. And it was observed uh, with the vacuum tower telescope located on Tenerife in Spain. And the simultaneous uh, data that was taken here is um, basically, um, uh, it evolves around the uh, shell spectra. So it has a slit spectrophotometry in the helium-1030 spectral range, uh, slit spectroscopy in the calcium-28542 and slit show images in H-alpha, of course, together with, uh, with the space uh, instrument. Here we see the flux ghost curve uh, of this flare, and in gray you see the um, individual raster scans that were that were taken um, with the telescope. Um, and so as you can see, the first map is uh, just before the flare started, and the second map catches the peak of the flare, and then the other maps uh, catch the, the decaying phase. Of course, it's a it's a raster scan, so it's not like on, in the Fabi Pro that you have information of the whole field of view but you still catch uh, quite a lot here. First, uh, let's have a look into what, what do we see uh, with SDO. And I'm stop this video just to get you familiar with uh, the channels that I'm showing here. It's on the upper left, it's in 94. Um, and in the lower right, we have the 1600. Just when I go a little bit back in time, so this is about two and a half hours. I'm just going to move quickly through it because in the upper left panel, you will see at first uh, some activity in the 94 channel, um, which then at some point you see these um, like foot points or kernels in all, I would say in all channels at the same time. After that, you will see that the uh, flare actually happens, it saturates in all the channels. And then nicely, the flare loops, post flare loops or loops just become visible also in all channels except uh, 1600. And if I go a little bit quicker in time, you see how these loops expand up and down. This is how it looks in Hinode, that's calcium 2H, of course, with a different cadence here, but you can nicely see that from the polarity inversion line, there start the two ribbons, one going north, the other one going south. And this is how it would look like uh, from our ground-based observations. And these are the H-alpha slit show images. Also, I'm going to do this manually just to get you familiar again, the time in the lower left corner, 7.50 UT in the morning. Um, actually, the data that is taken is what is covered by the slit between the two horizontal um, hairlines. So this is actually the information here, which is getting through the uh, spectrograph. So this is the first map. We see that we are actually scanning here the filament, but at the end of the scan, we see that, okay, these are our two bright kernels that we saw also in the STO images. So we see them also here in H alpha. Then the second map is when the uh, flare starts to peak. And nicely seen here is in the upper left part, which is actually not scanned by the slit, but this filament here, um, as you can see, if I move forward, actually erupts. But the other one, not just going back again, as, so you can see the eruption here of that filament. But um, the one we were actually scanning was not getting an eruption. But as you can see, the slit is covering exactly the peak of the flare. So we're getting there all that information. And this is the third map. So it nicely sees how the post flare loops are also getting filled here with H alpha. And yeah, this is the rest of the maps. So um, just to let you know that since the first map was not uh, exactly the same field of view than the second map, there's an overlap between map 
one and uh, two and three, and this is the overlap area here. So we can have information of all of these maps in that part together. So let us see here from the ground based observations. Let's go up in height. What do we find there? H alpha, again, these are in principle slit shot images, but um, I just uh, took the um, uh, information of one of the pixels next to the slit because uh, this then we can simulate a slit reconstructed image. And this is what we see. In the first map, we have the filament here. In the second map, we have the, the, the wrap, the, actually the flare impulsive phase. And then we see the post flare loops appearing in H alpha. If we go further up uh, in the calcium, we have again, we see the filament. We have here um, the calcium line in emission and the flare ribbons. And in the and you don't have the post flare loops here in calcium two. If we go further up uh, into the helium, what we have here is that during the impulsive phase, also we have the helium nicely in emission. And this is why I, I asked um, before uh, Jung if there is information about the helium profiles because actually. Um, the dark ribbon, which was mentioned before, um, yeah, well, it's maybe not that clearly seen, but I can see that after the bright stuff, which is appearing here, um, there is a darker area, then it gets grayish here again. So maybe this is also um, an indication of, of what uh, Jeong uh, presented in her talk. And nicely seen again in this post flare map uh, um, uh, loop that we have, the uh, loops filled also with um, plasma from uh, which is seen in helium here as well. But interesting, um, in the lower height, which I would say H alpha, you have post flare loops. In the calcium, you don't see them. And then again, above in principle, um, in helium, you see them again. So this um, remains a bit uh, mysterious to me. If we just make a cut out here uh, in the helium, just to have a look into the stocks profiles and um, just to let you know how these things look like there. And um, this is in the vertical direction, the slit, and in the horizontal direction, we have the wavelength. So we have stocks I, Q, U, and V. You can see nicely in helium that you have this emission up to yeah almost 1.7 um, I over I continuum. And in Stokes V, you have in the emission part of, of the helium, of course, a reversal, but also um, you don't have the typical Stokes V, you have um, a shifted red lot. I will come to that uh, later. And Stokes Q and U, it has information, but as you can see, it is uh, sometimes strongly red shifted and mixed. So here, possibly uh, different components are, are at work. If we just grab one of the single lines here from this one, as we represent it in, in this case like that. So we see how the emission is in helium. Um, in this case, there's not much in Q, but in U, you have signals um, from the helium triplet. And again, here in Stokes V, you can nicely see the very strong Stokes V shape of the blue component from helium. And then of the red component, which is actually the stronger peak here, you have a smaller Stokes V shape, but with a lobe which is extended to the right, which remains also um, yeah, not clear what that means. Just to give you a bit more information of the variety that we have uh, during the flare, this is not the time evolution. So um, it's just to show you a mix of profiles that can be seen in the flare actually and in the helium. So it's, um, yeah, that, that makes it so challenging to understand these signals. Let me go back to, to the calcium intensity profiles. And here I just picked up a few um, just to show you how they look like. Uh, again, um, with the crosses here, you can see where I picked them basically from the ribbons. And this is how they look like. So you have strongly emission here. And nicely seen during the flare map is how these profiles um, move quite strongly um, to the red, which uh, gives us information um, about that there are happening actually um, strong downflows. And if you model that, you can see that we get uh, velocities of up to 40 kilometers per second uh, downward at um, where these bright intensity profiles from calcium 2 are. So I'm just uh, wrapping up here already. Um, so I found it interesting that the first signals I found for the flare was in the IA94 uh, channel. 
Then um, the, the kernels were seen basically in all of the channels. Um, the uh, loops appear in all of them instead, uh, but not on in the 1600 uh, channel. From helium and calcium, um, we can extract the information that they are clearly in emission, that means above one. Uh, Stokes helium, uh, the Stokes profiles from helium are complicated and usually uh, that's probably indicating that there are overlapping components, which will be difficult to disentangle, but that's one of the goals of this project as well. Supersonic helium uh, downflows are expected and are seen here in the data because you see how redshifted these profiles are. Also in the calcium too, we find these uh, strong downflows. It, stay, it remains uh, for me not clear why we don't see the post flare loops in calcium. And interestingly, the filament remains stable, meaning that uh, the overlaying arcade, uh, which was nicely seen in the talk before from, from uh, Jaroslav, um, probably that this overlying arcade is uh, stronger or retaining this uh, filament down there. So next steps, and this is in the framework uh, where I'm working at the moment, is to adapt uh, the inversion code that we have, in this case, uh, the hazel one, uh, which is used for the helium stocks profiles, uh, adapt them to be able to interpret these stocks profiles uh, in emission on the solar disk, which is not possible at the moment then invert all the helium data and hopefully get their information about the magnetic field structure um, of, the, of the flare of, of these observations and then combine all this information with also the satellite information in space. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Christoph. So I have, see a couple of questions. The first one, I think the hand came up was uh, Graham, you should be able to unmute and ask your question now. Yeah. Hi, uh, they were really nice observations. Um, so two questions about the helium. Um, one, what was the magnitude of the of the dimming that you said you saw a hint of? And also, do you have any, I might have missed this, do you have temporal information for the helium observations? And if so, do you know how long that dimming persisted for at the ribbon uh, leading front? Okay, so we're talking about the dimming, right? You said? Yes. Um, well, I, I haven't looked into that. that that's why I'm uh, actually, I, I, that was interesting to see that in the different, in the talk from Jung. Um, I haven't looked into this dimming part. Um, so what I have is, it's like these six maps. So that's the evolution and time, but um, you, you cannot really follow the structure of the ribbon with a good cadence here. So, but one should look into these profiles here and that's, that will be a task definitely. Um, on the to-do list, yeah. The other question was? Uh, what was the magnitude of that dimming? So you showed the, the contrast of the emission. Do you have a similar um, value for, was it like a 20% dimming or 40%? I, I cannot, uh, sorry, I cannot tell you because I haven't looked into it, yeah. Um, yeah. Sure, no worries. That'll be um, really interesting to see the follow-up to that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks. Okay, that's all. Uh, Christoph, uh, you showed us very nice um, evolution of Stokes V profiles, and we shows that the amplitude of Stokes V is changing uh, uh, significantly do, during this flare, right? So, can you comment where this changing is coming from? Is it related to actual change of magnetic field, or it's something else? Um, uh, okay, that, that so you're referring to this movie. Yeah, yes. Okay, so I, I have to stress here one, one thing. This is not time evolution. This is just, um, if you go along this slit here, the red one marked here, so we just see a variation of the different types of profiles that you have along the slit, okay? So um, please be aware, it's not a time evolution. Um, that would be great to have that evolution, but unfortunately, we don't have the slit position which is fixed. So we're just scanning across the map. So I, this is not really evolution of these dogs profiles. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we actually have uh, 30 seconds for one more question. So maybe Paolo, if you could ask a quick question and Christoph give a quick answer. Otherwise it goes in the Q&A. <laughs> Paolo? Oh, hang on. Maybe you have to be allowed to talk. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank very quick one. Uh, Christoph, thanks for the talk. Uh, I am curious about the, those early foot points you, you mentioned in uh, AIA channels and also in page alpha. Uh, if you follow that up to any analysis or something. 
Um, so you mean the what I mentioned here with the foot points, which are seen in all yes. these? Yes. Um, yeah. the, the very beginning, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like this one here, yeah. Uh, no, I haven't looked into it. Um, again, this is all ongoing work, uh, but definitely worth it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, no, because we we did something similar a few years back. I'm very curious about that. I'll send you an email. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely, we should uh, keep in touch. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I see there's a couple more questions, but I'm afraid um, there's no time for that. So please put your Q and A's into the Q and A um, box, and Christoph will look at them. And Thanks. so we're on to the last talk before coffee, which is uh, Alberto Sainz Dalda. Also rather early in the morning for Alberto, I think. So you should be able to share your screen and take it away, Alberto. Hello, can you hear me and see me? Yes, we can hear you and well, see in you. Patan in Spain, so it's not that early. <laughs> it's almost siesta time. Anyway, so um, today I'm gonna talk about the, um, let, me, let me manage my window, sorry. Um, about uh, why we need to get a better constraint thermodynamics. Um, but Alberto, uh, Alberto, we can see a, a pencil case on your screen. <laughs> you can see what? There's some pencils, some colors were on your screen, some, you know, color selector. Okay, so let me... On top of some of your... Uh, your okay, slide. sorry. Now? Yeah, that looks okay. That's good, thank you. Okay, thank you, sorry. So I was telling that today I'm gonna to talk about why we need to get a better constraint thermodynamics of the flares um, to explain uh, the challenging uh, observations uh, for flares. So I'm gonna go very fast in this uh, introduction because after all, this is a specialist meeting. So um, you all know this cartoon, um, the most uh, important components that explains how the flare um, behaves. And one or maybe the most important question is uh, how this energy is, is released and how it's changed from the magnetic uh, energy stored in the corona through the lower atmosphere in different ways of uh, energy. And most of these um, energies are radiation thermal energy and non-thermal energy, including accelerated particles, large scale wave in open modes and turbulent motions. And I'm gonna pay attention to this last one because it has been a component that it has been always considered as a side effect of another processes uh, taking place in, during the flares. In the early 80s, this was uh, considered in the, in the top of the loops of the, uh, of the flares. <clears throat> and later, also in the reconnection sites, um, as, a, as I said, this turbulent motion has been always explained, explained as a consequence or as an effect of a, of a phenomenon happening in the, during the flare. Later, uh, Fletcher and Hudson uh, proposed that an argon, argon wave can um, hit the chromosphere, uh, hit the chromosphere, sorry, and produce a fast mode turbulence. And in fact, this can go back, uh, send back electrons back to the corona or even modify the chromosphere, for example, the magnetic field, as Lucha uh, uh, saw recently, and also the photosphere uh, that we already knew. Um, in this comprehensive work by uh, counter and collaborators, they use a uh, play of uh, a lot of instruments to understand how is the non-thermal velocity and to calculate what is the contribution of the turbulent kinetic energy. Even this contribution is very small compared with the energy budget of the flare is very important. And it's very important because they have the turbulence has a very high um, dissipation power. So one of the conclusions that this paper has is that they, the turbulence acts as a crucial intermediary in the transfer of energy. And that's why I'm paying attention to, to the, the role of the, of the turbulence. Um, also, uh, Jeffrey and collaborators, and this has been also already explained this morning, um, uh, uh, use this uh, numerical model to explain this observation, this variation of the non-thermal velocity before the flare. Um, they conclude that if you use a one wave 
and uh, with a varying amplitude, you cannot reproduce this behavior. But if you use a spectrum of different uh, interacting waves in a turbulent way, you can reproduce the observations um, in this case in silicon 4 for iris. Um, <clears throat> more recently, Tita and collaborators studied the turbulence in microflare. In this job, what is interesting is that they suggest the turbulence as a trigger of the flare. And this is based in a quite old model or a scenario that considered the uh, turbulence as favoring the reconnection and therefore be able to produce a flare or in this case, a micro flare. Um, and the observational evidence is that considering this scenario and calculating the values is in agreement with the, with the model. So they think that this support this, this, this scenario. Okay. There has been um, several measurements of the non-thermal velocity in the, in, the, in the corona, and basically uh, using uh, corona lines in from eyes or from iris more recently, and all these values are around 50, 60 kilometers per second. Um, as I said, it's very important to understand what is happening in the chromosphere, because even when the release of the energy happens in the corona, it's in the chromosphere where the energy is transferred. Uh, using different different uh, methods or different processes that all can reproduce turbulence. And as I said, uh, they play a significant role in transferring the energy. Okay, so I'm gonna focus in iris data, more particularly in the magnesium uh, H and K lines. And um, as you know, the magnesium H and K, they are resonance, they are optically thick, and they, have this norm in, in the quicksand, they have these two peaks that they are sensitive to the mid chromosphere. The core in, 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 is at the pressure where it's sensitive to the upper chromosphere and the elbows are sensitive to the minimum of temperature. In addition, we have the ultraviolet triplet that they are subordinate lines and they are sensitive to the low chromosphere. Okay, how did they look during the flares? These lines were first observed in 1984 by Lemaire and they observed that they become in emission and they were not able to distinguish if the core, it was also in emission because the resolution, it was not that good, but they, were, they definitely observed the ultraviolet triplet in emission. Um, <clears throat> more recently, it has been proved using uh, mature learning techniques by Panos and, and Klein that this triplet emission, in fact, is a, the best future to distinguish between active region normal profiles and pre-flare profiles. Okay, so several, uh, 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 there has been several attempts to, to reproduce these this pointy profiles. This is a work by uh, Fatima Rubio and collaborators and they were, use, they were using the observation for this uh, now famous flare as trying to synthesize calcium and hydrogen from using uh, radin and taking RESI as input data. Something that also uh, 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 David Kulitsi and collaborators has done trying to reproduce the calcium, and it was explained also this morning. But in here, to reproduce these values for the calcium, they need a microturbulence of 4.5 kilometers per second, while for the uh, um, uh, magnesium, they need 10 kilometers per second. But as you can see, they are far to reproduce the, the broad of the, of the lines. What they say is we need a larger microturbulence, as larger as 27, what is in, in agreement with this value obtained by uh, Graham Kerr and collaborators, but also an increase in the electron density. Okay, so finally, there is this, uh, uh, this uh, job by Sue that is using not only the uh, RH to simulate, but instead of using the quadratic star, what is encoded in RH, he's using a, a star uh, with database uh, from Medon. And what they found is that you really need to multiply the, uh, by a factor of 30, this uh, database star weeks. Uh, so it's quite also a large value. And if you want to account only for microturbulence, you need as values as large as 30 and 50 kilometers per second, what is far away of the normal that you can see in the quite or plus. Okay, there. So we have investigated this, uh, this, this uh, flare that you know is the, the one observed in, in March in 2014. This is the flare. You all know this, this, this data, I think. 
Um, so if you want to embed this data, you are going to need a lot of computational uh, uh, time. So you can feel tempted to, to use Iris Square. That is the tool that we developed to embed a magnesium data from Iris. And this is the visualization tool. So this is his, this point in the outer part of the ribbon. And the fit is quite good. If you go here, this is also quite good. But when you go to the ribbon, you see that even there are some pointy uh, profiles in the database that is not fitting at all. And should, we shouldn't be surprised because this is specifically mentioned in the manual. We need to provide, we need to do a devoted inversion. For that, we use a stick that it has been developed by Jaime de la Cruz. And we made the inversion here. In gray, you can see this reference uh, profile that is not quite sunny, it's between the quite sun and the, and the ribbon. And you can see this huge profile with no emission in the core, but very well fit, and with emission in the ultraviolet, what is not well fit, honestly. Here you have another, also very, very large, but with no emission. And finally, you have this one. This is very, very similar to the one that Fatima and Sue, they trying to reproduce. And you can see that we are able to fit it. What we have to pay attention here is that here we have an enhancement of electron density and here as well. But here we have both an enhancement of density, electron density and temperature. The other point that I was interested in is to see the behavior of the microtubulin, what is in green line here. And you can see there is an enhancement in these regions where these lines are sensitive. The problem is that these all three parameters are mixed, are coupled in the, in the, in the spectral information. So then we have to read the textbook. This is quite old, but it's very clear. What we have to do is to use two different lines that they are sensitive to the same spectral re uh, region in the sun to distinguish the temperature from the microturbulence. These two lines, in this case, are magnesium and carbon-2. And we have this data in iris. So what I have done is to invert simultaneously magnesium and carbon. This is the inversion for profiles 90 minutes before. As you can see, the inversions look good. And now when we approach to 30 minutes, now we start seeing this feature in emission as random panels was predicting. And in this contest, Magnus Bus was working at, at Lockheed at that time, and, and me and, and Bar, we started studying this, making a similar study, looking for profiles that they are uh, definitely preflect. But we want to keep the whole spectrum. We cannot do a feature selection or a feature study that, like Brandon did. We have to keep the whole spectrum. And then this is what we did. And we found this, for example, for the we, we have seven different uh, profiles, but we have here four. This is the preflare. You can see the carbon lines in emission, the magnesium lines in emission, the ultraviolet line in emission. And this is for the preflare. This is in the umbra, what is very similar, but different. And you will see what is different. In this case, we have an enhancement of temperature and density here and here, where the ultraviolet line is sensitive. While in this, and we have an, an, an enhancement in microturbulence here. While in the umbral double peak, even they have an enhancement profiles that are very large, they don't have, they don't show a huge enhancement in temperature. They show an enhancement in density, but not in temperature. This is uh, the selection of all the profiles using uh, the, the pointy profiles for the preflare population. As you can see, this is all together, but we can say these three classes, and these profiles are showing a consistent behavior in the model atmosphere, even when they are inverted individually. This is an animation showing how these lines are inverted. And the dashed line is the inversion corresponding Alberto, to- Alberto, you have two minutes left. OK, yes. When I made the inversions only for the magnesium lines, and the thick line is when I consider both lines simultaneously. So I'm constraining better the atmosphere because I consider in magnesium and carbon. And then I re I'm recovering a better parameters for the uh, microturbulence, for the temperature and the density. Okay, so this is a uh, way. So that was before, how is in the, in the flare? So this is what's, what is happening in the flare. Uh, during the maximum of the flare, you can see now, this is the pointy, very pointy profiles that are fitting very well. They are fitting the ultraviolet. And um, this is for different cases. And they are also fitting. But there is something that is, is, is making wondering what is happening here. The enhancement here is very low. 
you know, during the flares, there is a pushing of the atmosphere that can be happening. So we need to know what is happening below the foot of the chromosphere. And we can do that using the iris multiliner uh, capabilities. We have inverted this line, carbon and magnesium, but we can also invert these lines. And this is what I have done in collaboration with, this, uh, with Arian. He was a, a high school student at that time. And we have inverted the carbon lines, the magnesium lines, the ultraviolet lines, in this case, the one and the two and three, and six photospheric lines simultaneously. In this case, for a sunspot, but we are going in, this, in that direction. We are going to invert simultaneously photospheric and chromospheric line observed with iris. So this is the main results. We need an enhancement, both in temperature and density. And we recover microturbulence velocity of the order of 10 and 15, not 20, not 30, not 50. These values are more in agreement with the observed by Jaime and by Matt in different uh, chromospheric future. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alberto. Very interesting talk. Um, now we've got time maybe for one quick question, if anyone has a question they would like to ask directly. I don't see it. Oh yes, uh, Julius has just put his hand up. Uh, you should be able to unmute and talk now. Yeah, thank you. Alberto, uh, yeah. when, whenever I see an uh, inversion of uh, chromospheric spectroscopy, and uh, when, when I see that observations uh, lack, observations of the hydrogen, I'm asking myself, how is uh, determined the ionization in these uh, regions which then reflect into all ionization species involved uh, in the inversion? So for me, it's a little bit problem to understand how to constrain ionization in the chromosphere without having uh, observation of hydrogen. Thank you. Yes, um, yes, I understand your point, but um, well, as you know, modeling or trying to fit something similar to, uh, to hydrogen is, is absolutely, basically it's impossible. So um, we have to work what we have and I think um, the best tool that we have right now is a stick uh, for, this, uh, for these cases. Um, also, Nicole is working very well, um, and, and that's what, what we have. So that's what we can use it, I think. But I understand your, your concern. Okay, okay. Uh, that's all. Uh, uh, whenever I see, let's say, multi-line <coughs> observations, lacking observations of hydrogen, so this is what I'm asking myself, and. Up to now, I haven't received a clear answer how the people deal with uh, ionization and, and hydrogen within such inversions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, but uh, yeah. I, I fully understand the great amount of work behind this, and it's amazing, just uh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um... Thank you very much uh, for the talk uh, and questions and more questions can go in the Q&A if people have them. So now it's uh, time for our um, afternoon coffee break. We're about five minutes behind schedule. So I think probably uh, if people are prepared just to um, take a 10 minute coffee break and come back at 3.15, I hope that will be all right. So at 3.15, we'll reconvene. The next three speakers, I'm going to promote you to panelists so you can share your screen. So be prepared for a message. Thank you very much. Okay, I was about to say that it's time to start, but Adam has left his desk or his cage. Here. <laughs> oh, here, here, he is, here he is back. Okay, so we're about to start the last session of this uh, very interesting uh, RAS discussion, specialist discussion meeting. And this is an invited talk coming up now, spectroscopic signatures of explosive phenomena in the 3D flaring chromosphere from particles to pixels and point sources. And it's Adam Kowalski. Go ahead, please. Well, thanks very much. Um, and thanks for uh, the invitation to talk. This is a really interesting um, workshop. Um, and uh, here's an overview of what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about uh, spectroscopic signatures of explosive phenomena in the chromosphere, um, namely the uh, formation of red wing asymmetries in the chromospheric lines and how they connect to uh, the physics of chromospheric condensations. 
Um, I may refer to those as CCs, chromospheric condensations, and uh, these phenomena um, are transient <laughs> and um, uh, short, uh, short-lived uh, uh, processes in the impulsive phase um, of the flare. I'm going to bring in some new work we've been doing on line broadening, um, improving our uh, microphysics in the models uh, for better um, understanding of the uh, densities that are achieved in these chromospheric condensations. Um, and uh, some co-authors on this work um, are David and Graham and Joel. Um, I see that they're on. Uh, I will briefly touch on uh, the 1D to 3D transition and why um, uh, one aspect of it and why it's uh, so so difficult to do for, for flares. Um, and then I'll connect to stellar flares. So, um, uh, so we have particles here, line broadening physics, um, uh, pixels, 1D models, and then uh, point sources, um, the 3D implications for uh, stellar flare modeling. Okay, so I'll start with a famous observation of H alpha um, during a solar flare. On the right, you have the excess spectra and the spectra um, were obtained every eight seconds here. Um, and time increasing upwards. And what you see is a uh, redshifted satellite component, which is very broad and becomes brighter um, over time and less redshifted. Um, and so this is what we refer to as a red wing asymmetry or RWA. Um, and um, that's what I'm gonna spend probably most of the talk here uh, discussing. Um, so it has long been thought that uh, these uh, features uh, were due to chromospheric condensations uh, in response to explosive heating in the in the chromosphere, and they were modeled um, early on since the early 80s actually. Um, and Fisher 1989 uh, came along and um, uh, developed uh, essentially zero D models, analytic models of of these chromospheric condensation timescales, um, and uh, quantified several timescales. In fact, um, one is uh, the lifetime of the the condensation um, or the, the downflow. Um, and that uh, was about 30 to 60 seconds. Um, and uh, that's the one that's typically discussed uh, in the literature. Um, however, there's another time scale and uh, this is the half-life of the condensation. That is the time it takes the condensation to go from its maximum downward velocity to half of it. And that was very short. That's like four to eight seconds in, in his work. And that is inconsistent with uh, the observations here. Um, and Fisher discussed this and he speculated it, speculated the discrepancy was because of spatial resolution that uh, the, the uh, spatial resolution of these observations was one to two arc seconds. And if you added up several loops in a single pixel uh, that you could extend the time scales from five seconds to uh, uh, near, near 20 seconds actually. Um, <clears throat> And uh, however, uh, there hasn't really been too much work looking into the detailed physics of what could be causing these condensations to be evolving too rapidly um, in the, uh, the models here. And so this is, this is uh, the, uh, the timescale problem that Zhang Chu mentioned. I just wanted to reemphasize it and say it's a really, really interesting problem. Um, and that's, it's something we, could, we will be able to address with the DCUST and the hydrogen line observations um, as long as we have high time resolution. Okay, so then along came Iris and we saw the red wing asymmetry show up in other chromospheric lines and uh, the spectra were truly stunning. Um, here's an example of uh, sit and stare observations showing the evolution of magnesium two uh, triplet line um, in Iris. <clears throat> Every um, nine seconds is shown here going downwards. And uh, you see that initially there is emission around the rest wavelength and a very faint and broad um, satellite component, which becomes brighter over time and less redshifted and eventually merges into the emission around the stationary um, component, forming what is apparently a single line profile. So if we didn't have the spatial res or the temporal resolution, we wouldn't know the time history here. And we wouldn't be able to uh, interpret this line profile properly um, as actually a sum of two components. <laughs> Okay, so we have had some success in modeling these two components uh, using um, the Radian code uh, and uh, spectral synthesis um, after the fact. And so um, Radian uh, is a, a 1D radiation hydrodynamics code. Um, 
and uh, can simulate this response to electron and ion uh, beam heating. And so we use electron beam heating. We use rather large beam fluxes. Um, and so here's a snapshot of uh, one of these simulations um, showing a, an iron two um, profile with uh, emission around the rest wavelength and then a uh, red satellite component here. Um, and depending on how we average uh, the model over an exposure time, we can get to different strengths in the red wing asymmetry. Um, <clears throat> so what happens is that uh, you have an explosion in the chromosphere and uh, the pressure gradients drive uh, the, the upflow, the evaporation, and then the downflow, the condensation, forming a very high density, narrow region of about 25 kilometers. Uh, this region starts at about 80,000 K and then as it accrues more mass, it cools. And then eventually it reaches 10,000 K. Um, actually only after a few seconds, this is the timing problem. When it's at 10,000 K, it's now shining very brightly in iron two and in um, magnesium two and hydrogen and all the chromospheric lines. And so that's where this red uh, wing component comes from. The stationary um, emission component comes from the layers immediately below the condensation that's being swept up by the condensation. And this, these layers are more extended in height and are being heated continuously by the highest energy electrons in the beam, uh, over 100 keV, reaching this maintaining temperatures around 8,000 to 10,000 Kelvin. Okay, so this is the basic model and the basic picture. <clears throat> you also notice that the uh, broadening of uh, the models um, is you know, very small. Uh, we actually have to be very clever with our microturbulence parameter in order to get something close to the observed broadening. And that this um, a variation in the microturbulence parameter is shown as the blue spectrum there. Okay, so the red wing asymmetry is observed in many types of uh, flare lines. Here's um, the same flare, but a different kernel in magnesium two, a triplet line, um, carbon one, and silicon two. Um, you'll notice that at any given time, uh, the red wing asymmetry um, is, uh, uh, is, is not the same among the emission lines, right? So the, the maximum intensity here um, varies relative to the intensity around the rest wavelength, depending on the emission line. Okay, so this could be a temperature effect perhaps, um, but it also um, is affected by the optical depth. So looking at a different flare and two different iron two lines with different optical depths, actually dramatically different optical depths. Here's uh, the observed spectrum. Um, just just the look at the pink spectrum here with the red wing asymmetry um, as uh, slightly fainter than the emission at the rest wavelength, which appears slightly blue shifted, I guess. Um, I don't know if that's significant. Um, and uh, then in the bottom panel, we have a much more optically thick iron two line at the same time showing the red wing asymmetry much brighter. So the larger optical depths push the formation higher up into the condensation and allow less radiation from the stationary flare layers to escape because the radiation has to go through this very dense chromospheric condensation. So that's the interpretation we're working with here on the uh, variation of the red wing asymmetry. Okay, going back to H alpha, this isn't the only type of uh, chromospheric flare line that's observed. In fact, there's quite a wide variety of, uh, of chromospheric flare lines, especially in H alpha, which is historically the best observed uh, chromospheric flare line um, uh, through, through the 90s. <clears throat> so on the left, we have um, a flare with uh, the H alpha that has a bulk redshift and it's broadened. On the right or in the middle, we have a H alpha profile that has a bulk blue shift and it's broadened. And on the right, we have an H alpha profile that doesn't have any redshift or blue shift, but does have some broadening due to increased charge density in the chromosphere. And of course, as Christoph showed, um, there are some really amazing um, uh, results um, uh, of the H alpha line and calcium two lines um, recently, thanks to uh, imaging spectrographs. Um, however, these don't have very broad uh, wavelength coverage. Um, and uh, I'm gonna show why uh, that is potentially a problem for better understanding chromospheric condensations. Um, but I want to look very briefly at uh, the broadening of non-hydrogen lines uh, a little closer. This was nicely summarized by Alberto. So I'm just gonna go over it very briefly um, is that uh, actually, you know, there's a difference 
of uh, whether you um, include updated uh, collisional broadening theory for non-hydrogen lines. And so Ying Ji Zhu um, is a really fantastic student who looked into this and figured it out um, that actually uh, we needed to include the uh, updated theory from the Stark B database. And then if you add a 30, um, a factor of 30 uh, to this uh, damping parameter, then you get the damping wings here, um, which is um, demonstrating that uh, this is probably a damping effect um, and as opposed to a microturbulence effect. Um, so <clears throat> there could be actually two uh, sources of discrepancy here. Either it's a, a, a damping effect and our collisional broadening theory needs further updates for the conditions of the flare chromosphere, which are pretty extreme. Um, or uh, it's a macro physics problem. That is our flare atmosphere is uh, just wrong and we need more heating where the wings are formed, perhaps uh, lower down in the atmosphere. Just illustrating uh, the variation with microturbulence and how you have to actually fine tune the microturbulence parameter as a function of height to get something that's close to the observations. You can see in the bottom panel here that the fine tuned microturbulence does not get the, uh, the far wings well and it um, does a pretty wacky job with the magnesium triplets. Um, so we think that in fact, uh, this is some damping effect, um, whether, uh, whether it's coupled with the uh, uncertainties in the actual structure of the flare atmosphere um, is also a possibility. Okay, so what about macro turbulence? That is um, the fact that uh, the um, observations from IRIS uh, could be sampling several uh, flare foot points in the same pixel. Um, <clears throat> so like a multi-thread analysis of a single pixel. Uh, so here's a magnesium 2 um, K profile. Uh, this is a much brighter profile than what I showed previously, but it's the same flare. And so you have these broad wings, which go towards a central reversal. And then you have a really bright red wing asymmetry. At least this is my interpretation of this. Um, and so uh, you have very bright and broad uh, emission extending out to the red wing here. And so what these authors did is they took a Radian model and they took the velocity field and um, changed it by hand to have very strong downflows. Um, <clears throat> this is um, very similar to what our uh, models of chromospheric condensation show, though the authors didn't really make a uh, connection. Um, and uh, they have different velocity profiles here. And then they synthesize the spectra and add them together with some ratio and they get the light blue teal curve, which really nicely reproduces, you know, the extent of the red wing asymmetry here. Okay, so even though they did not resolve for the um, uh, conservation of mass and momentum um, that are included in the uh, forward modeling approach, um, I think that uh, maybe these model, these um, semi-empirical models are telling us that the 1D uh, solutions to the chromospheric condensations are actually too dense. We already know they're too fast. And those two things are actually intricately related through the conservation equations of mass and momentum. Um, so uh, we can work together, uh, these two approaches. I think there are really interesting synergies to be made uh, by crosstalk. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the DCIS, of course, will have much higher spatial resolution. Um, and we'll be able to further diagnose the issues uh, surrounding uh, the macro turbulence, that is the superposition of different uh, velocity fields in the same pixel. Um, and it should be noted that the velocities I showed in the previous slide are not um, are the bulk velocities in the atmosphere. They're not the random velocities, the, 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 the actual, you know, quote unquote turbulence. Okay, so here's an image of um, a flare ribbon from IRIS, an SGI and slit jaw image uh, 2830 showing a really nice kernel here. And I, I took Iris and I put it at the sun and I observed Hurricane Teddy with it. And you get this image here. And then I actually took the DCIST and the VISP and I, and I also put it at the sun, but I brought it back. And this is what I observed. So you can see that the details are, I think are gonna be really, really interesting to study um, around these flare kernels here. Okay, so the DCAS will provide better spatial resolution. It will also provide higher cadence. And importantly, I think it will lead to a resurgence in the study of hydrogen, Balmer, and Poshin lines. 
Um, because you, that has a uh, broader wavelength coverage around each line, 10 to 20 angstroms. And you can selectively choose, strategically choose which lines to, to observe over the whole optical spectrum. So it's very flexible. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna talk about now is the broadening in the hydrogen lines and what that can do for us in understanding the uh, dynamics of the uh, chromospheric condensations. Okay, so the broadening of the hydrogen lines is very dramatic. Um, and uh, thanks to the, um, uh, what is known as the stark Lacerdo effect, also known as the Stark effect. And the hydrogen lines broaden uh, very dramatically because um, they, uh, their energy levels are split linearly with an electric field. Um, and so that's illustrated here on the left. Uh, we have the uh, energy levels of hydrogen. You can see that uh, the energy levels are split and that the, um, uh, the splitting increases up the series. So we expect the <laughs> higher order lines to be broader than the lower order lines like H alpha, H beta. Okay, so what is the electric field that actually splits the lines uh, in the flare chromosphere? Well, it's the ambient charge density from the partially ionized nature of the flare chromosphere. It's the electrons and ions, each contributing to the broadening um, of the transitions here. And uh, how do we know it's so important in flares? Well, um, from the old days of solar flare studies, for sure, but also from stellar flares. I show two different stellar, stellar flares and two different stars on the right. Um, calcium-2 doesn't broaden very dramatically at all in these flares, very narrow. Um, because uh, calcium-2 and other non-hydrogen lines only broaden quadratically with the electric field. Uh, in fact, the broadening is about a thousand times less than the linear hydrogenic broadening. So the H, H epsilon lines are very broad here and same in this flare. Um, the hydrogen lines are even broader uh, in, the, in the impulsive phase and still are broad in the decay phase. However, it's not so simple as we have to include an accurate theory in our models. And it's long been an issue of what theory to actually include. And can we make an approximation to the broadening of the hydrogen lines? Um, <clears throat> so this has led to a lot of uh, variations in the type of approximations that have been made in the um, solar and especially solar flare modeling community, first outlined by Johns Crawl. So here's the H gamma line uh, profile um, from a slab um, showing various uh, different prescriptions that have been used in the past in solar flare modeling. Um, this is for one electron density. And just compare the solid line styles, which are apples to apples. I'll talk about the dotted line styles, dashed line styles in a few minutes here. So which one is the correct one to use? <clears throat> so I'll tell you the answer, um, but I first wanted to note that in the past, um, in Radian, we have used um, uh, the light blue and both the dark blue, depending on the era. The correct profile, in fact, is the solid black one here. And these are the state-of-the-art um, broadening profiles of hydrogen from the white dwarf community. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they include a lot of physics and importantly, they include the electrons and proton broadening self consistently with, uh, with each other because the electrons are really fast, the protons are really slow and the electrons can cause transitions among the proton broadened states of each level. We say it's non-adiabatic in that, in that regards. So these are not void profiles. In fact, they have uh, limits, at least for the low order lines, they have limits um, that are like Holtzmark profiles, but are not Holtzmark profiles closer to line center. <clears throat> so, um, and for the higher order lines, they become even more complicated. So we put these profiles into Radian and uh, we wanted to um, see what the broadening response was in the hydrogen lines. Um, and if that could re reveal anything uh, interesting about the physics of chromospheric condensations, if it's telling of the electron densities that are in these chromospheric condensations so that we can comp compare to future observations with the VISP. So here's H alpha, the new prediction at some snapshot in electron beam heating model. Um, as a solid line compared to our older prescription, which was just a placeholder until we could actually do this. Um, and as you can see, there's a dramatic difference here. And the wavelength range of IBIS is shown here, um, a very narrow range. And clearly we need broader coverage into the wings, um, which is also a conclusion 
that uh, Malcolm Druitt et al. and their work um, reached for their models. Um, <clears throat> I think that's and, two left. Two minutes, okay. Oh, why? <clears throat> Okay, so uh, here's the H gamma evolution. Um, <clears throat> and you can see that uh, the broadening is dramatic over just 10 seconds. It becomes highly redshifted and then becomes less redshifted and fainter over time. Um, so we can actually now uh, test these predictions with uh, the BISP. <clears throat> so here's the formation of H gamma. Um, and uh, uh, this is the contribution function, the logarithm of it during a snapshot. And um, the emergent line profile is the solid line. And um, this is a wavelength range of VISP. And most of the line profile forms in a very narrow region at the top of the condensation, actually over one kilometer around the, uh, the line peak wavelength here. Um, the broad wings are not just due to electron density increases, but also due to the curve of growth due to the large optical depths um, in the line formation. Um, and we've also found that uh, the Eddington-Barbier relation holds in the formation around line center or the peak, peak wavelength here. So that explains why the lines get fainter over time because the condensation cools and the source function um, can be related to the emergent intensity thanks to uh, Barbier and Eddington. Okay, so the condensations here are really dense, five times 10 to the 14 per cubic centimeter. So I just wanted to show this movie real briefly um, of the evolution. Just look at the bottom panel, which is the gas density and the velocity field. Um, so let me uh, loop it here. And uh, <clears throat> so we have a buildup of mass into the condensation um, and then uh, consistent with the downflows and then the conservation of momentum um, is satisfied here with the upflows. And so I just wanted to point out that uh, actually um, Kennedy et al studied the chromospheric condensation and suggested that um, the late phase evolution of this could possibly explain uh, the um, very low source heights that were inferred on the limb uh, during a flare in Martinez Oliveros. So with the hydrogen lines, now we can actually test this idea um, is, uh, is look at how the broadening increases uh, in the late phase um, of heating of a flare kernel. We predict it should get very broad and very faint. Um, uh, because of the increase in optical depth in the condensation, but a decrease in the temperature. So if we go to the higher order lines, um, we should expect them to have larger broadening than the H alpha, H beta, and H gamma profiles. Um, but in fact, our synthesis shows this is, this is the opposite actually occurs. This is really, really intriguing. Okay, so these lines are narrower than H alpha and H beta and H gamma. Also, they don't have any bulk redshifts. So what is going on? Well, I'm just gonna tell you the answer here. It's that the densities in the condensation are so high that the upper levels of these transitions are completely dissolved. And so you have a relatively constant opacity over this wavelength regime. So you're seeing deeper into the flare chromosphere into the stationary flare layers where the electron density is a lot lower and therefore you have much less broadening. And I have an archival observation here just showing you that, okay, maybe these spectra are not so crazy. Okay, so the 1D to 3D transition, I just wanted to talk about radiative backwarming effects very briefly. Um, so here are the uh, 3D equations of um, radiation magnetohydrodynamics. Um, and uh, it has B everywhere. Uh, but curiously, the 1D equations in Radian um, are more numerous, though they don't have B. So there are more equations that are solved in 1D than in 3D. So there can be crosstalk here as well. Now, I think what will really um, be a big breakthrough in the uh, 3D modeling aspects is the issues of backwarming. Um, so here's a nice illustration from Fisher. I'm just gonna skip it, but um, there's a nice geometrical factor equation that's given here and that uh, the bound-free continua um, heat the photosphere, whereas the XEUV heats the top of the chromosphere. So there's various um, backwarming effects depending on what, what wavelengths are actually backwarming the atmosphere. Okay, so um, I'm gonna skip over this and then just j jump to this, which is, I think we need stronger uh, empirical evidence of backwarming. Um, bonafide signatures of upper photospheric is actually really hard. Um, if you observe a continuum increase in the optical, it doesn't necessarily mean it's coming from the photosphere. Um, 
uh, and we don't have broad wavelength coverage spectra to actually um, strategically determine where the heating is, is coming from. But instead we can look at uh, uh, timing analysis investigations where Kawadi et al. looked at the um, uh, uh, fast decay phase, attributing it to the core of a kernel, and then the long decay phase of a, of a single pixel attributing to the backwarming uh, over a larger region, um, which is more gradual. <clears throat> and then one, uh, two slides on stellar flares here. Um, what we really need is with the resurgence of white light observations from in the stellar flare community, our areas as a function of wavelength. As you see here, the white light areas are really small and the um, H alpha ribbons are very large uh, and extended. And we need such constraints. And here's an example of this modeling process in um, uh, stellar flare community. We have um, uh, fainter uh, ribbon or halo-like ribbon structures and then brighter kernels. We basically take the bright kernel and say that's a very high beam flux and that gives us most of the continuum and broadening. And then we have a fainter um, ribbon area here, which is heated by a smaller beam flux, which gives us most of the emission line flux. And so we add these together in a very ad hoc way, and we get the um, light blue curve, which nicely rep reproduces this very famous flare observation of an MDOR flare. So we need such reality checks. So I hope I got you really interested in the red wing asymmetry and the physics of chromospheric condensations. And I think it'd be really great to have a conversation on where we go with 3D physics. What codes do we use, RAD MHD, or do we develop a new framework? So thanks for your attention and your time. And I look forward to uh, discussing some issues with you. Thank you, Adam. That was brilliant. Uh, and I, we don't, we're fairly short of time, I think, here. But if there, were, were, if there was one important question, we could probably squeeze it in. And I don't see any hands being raised. Alberto's hand is up. Oh, interesting. Uh, would you uh, release him, please? Yeah. Oops. Meanwhile, I'll just ask Adam, since I know you know the answer to this right away. Uh, what about the uh, charge exchange reactions in terms of line broadening? Yeah, so I was wondering about that. And uh, Graham Kerr's um, got some really interesting work in the works. And we were discussing the issues with uh, line broadening and the charge exchange and that it seems that um, the uh, the redshifted emission is so redshifted that it's redshifted out of the you know the opacity maximum of the line profile, and that maybe most of the broadening will be due to a velocity broadening effect of of the actual protons that are getting recombined to <laughs> that are capturing the charges. <laughs> um, so yeah, the far wing opacity may be important and a uh, very slightly, but it's so far in the wings that. Uh, the opacity is very low by that point. Okay, thanks. So Alberto? Yes, um, thank you very much for such a nice uh, talk. I have a question for you, uh, specifically on this uh, slide. Why you don't consider inversions? Uh, you are, I mean, you are considering a lot of codes there, right. but no. Right, right. Yeah, so so the reason is, um, is that uh, the issues with the microturbulence and kind of like, uh, I, I feel like uh, the, strat the, uh, the strategy to pursue the time evolution of the red wing asymmetry um, is best um, addressed with uh, forward modeling. And in particular, um, my, my uh, issue is with the velocity gradients that are inferred in inversions is that those cause ma a mass rearrangement in the atmosphere, which causes an opacity increase in certain lines, especially in the optically thick lines. And so, so because the mass and momentum equations are not solved, that's why I don't have these listed here, but, but perhaps there are really uh, interesting ways to, to collaborate and to work together. For example, I'm more than happy to work with the inversion modelers on incorporating the accurate hydrogen broadening into their lines, addressing Julius, uh, into their models, addressing Julius's point. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Yeah, yeah sure. Well, okay, well, thank you. And we should push on to the next talk. If you will stop screen sharing. Yep. And uh, URI Learnsec will talk about slipping player kernels and the behavior of blue and red shifts of the transition region and chromospheric lines. Slipping player kernels somehow reminds me of popcorn, but never mind. <laughs> All right. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, everything is fine.
All right, uh, perfect. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for introducing me. Um, before I get to my talk, I will give you a short introduction to solar flares. I'm wondering how can I hide this thing? I'm not sure that's possible. Uh, I would do it like this. So solar flares are these energetic phenomena in the atmosphere of the sun, as all of you know, and they are powered by magnetic reconnection uh, in which field lines change their connectivities to reach a lower energetic state. And traces of reconnection are very well visible uh, in flare ribbons, uh, sometimes termed footprints of solar flares, usually observed in the UV as these uh, bright and elongated structures. Uh, as, my, as the speaker before me said, these ribbons are composed of these bright kernels. Uh, in fact, these um, correspond to footprints of uh, flare loops uh, that are arising as a consequence of the reconnection. Uh, now, in three dimensions, this is uh, happening uh, by the slipping reconnection, uh, which is characterized by a sequential change of connectivity between neighboring field lines, uh, translated in the uh, apparent slipping motion of uh, magnetic field lines along flare ribbons. In observations, the slipping reconnection is manifested uh, uh, as the slipping motion of flare loops, usually observed in the hot filter channels of AIA, or the flare kernels, their foot points. Uh, it again usually observed in the color emission. Uh, this uh, cartoon on the right uh, shows us uh, this, con this sequential uh, motion of uh, flare kernels along the ribbons as a consequence of the reconnection. Uh, two more animations. Uh, the left one uh, shows the sequential change of connectivity between the field lines in the simulation. Uh, and the right one uh, presents AI 131 channel observations of slipping flare loops. Uh, by the decade of 2014. Now, uh, yeah, I don't know how to get rid of this. So basically, uh, these, uh, the accelerated particles uh, from the reconnection uh, impact the chromosphere where they deposit their energy and trigger flows of plasma. Uh, we recognize downflows usually uh, in lines of the chromosphere or the, or the transition region, uh, which are signatures of the chromospheric condensation. And then there are the apples of plasma in the chromospheric evaporation, uh, usually observed in flare lines. And this is much more dynamical phenomenon. Here I uh, study uh, the rather famous event from 2015, June 22nd. This is an M6 class flare accompanied by an eruption of a hot channel, uh, which eruption was seen here for a brief moment uh, in the 131 channel of AIA. I will let it run once again. In the meantime, I will tell you that we're using uh, AI data combined uh, with iris sparse raster observations of this event. Uh, the raster consisted of 16 slip positions taken at the one second exposures, which is important uh, later on. This raster was centered at a pair of flare ribbons that formed during this event, one to the north, and the other to the south, uh, with the northern one uh, especially coincident with this positive polarity flux, uh, and, the no, uh, and the southern one uh, with the negative polarity flux concentrations, sort of intermittent. Here we will mostly focus on the northern ribbon uh, because that's what Iris observed. Uh, as you can see, this uh, ribbon was uh, hooked. It had, uh, it had this J-shaped extension, which was very dynamical, uh, evolving in time. Now, the evolution of this ribbon was accompanied by the apparently slipping flare loops observed in the 131 channel of AIA in this animation to the right, and the uh, flare kernels observed by a uh, slidger imager of iris uh, uh, visible here to the left. Now, using the time distance diagram plotted along the direction of the slippage, we found that the velocities of the slipping loops were rather typical between some 20 and 60 kilometers per second. And uh, one of these loops, uh, which motion is fitted using these pink lines, actually corresponded to a series of bright kernels that were slipping towards the north, uh, as viewed uh, by the Slidio imager. And these kernels uh, were the focus of our study, uh, mostly using the 1402.7 line of the silicon-4 ion. So when the kernel appeared and uh, when it entered the raster of iris, uh, the line was uh, sort of weak and it, it had these pronounced straight wings. Uh, later, when the kernel slipped slightly towards the north, uh, the line broadened uh, and exhibited these indications of blue wing enhancements. 
uh, and later on in the terminal position of the kernel, uh, the line was slightly stronger, but redshifted again. So there was this evolution between the redshifts and blue shifts. In order to investigate the velocities of the silicon four line uh, in this path, in this short path of the kernel during its slippage, we produce maps of Doppler velocities from the observed uh, uh, peak wavelengths. And we found, as is usually the case of this line, that uh, this line was typically redshifted. However, there was a small <coughs> region of some eight pixels uh, along one slip position uh, where the line was blue shifted with blue shifts of some uh, 50 kilometers per second in some pixels. Now, these blue shifts were short living, uh, observed in one raster only. So the lifetime was below 34 seconds, which is the cadence uh, in this raster. Uh, which sort of indicates that maybe mm, this is the reason why the silicon four blue shifts are observed so rarely, uh, actually with iris observations reported in two events only, uh, I mean flares. In the same pixels, uh, we also investigated maps of red blue asymmetries, which measure the, ref uh, the relative strengths of the line's wings. Uh, uh, yet again, uh, in the same field of view, most of the pixels corresponding to the kernel along its slippage uh, uh, exhibited these uh, positive uh, RBAs, which means that the uh, red wings of the line were dominating, again, uh, corresponding to some older observations. However, as the time went by, there was a few pixels uh, where the line's blue wing was dominating, and some of these pixels actually corresponded even to those where the line was blue shifted. So we observed some, some pixels where the line was both blue shifted and had pronounced blue wing. Uh, in one of these pixels, we investigated uh, the temporal evolution of the silicon four line and also some uh, chromospheric lines. Uh, now, uh, and we did so uh, before, during, and after the kernel crossed the slate of iris in a fixed position. And the silicon four line plotted uh, in this uh, uh, blue, uh, with these blue lines uh, during the passage of the kernel became uh, slightly redshifted. Uh, similarly, the carbon two line uh, also with some blue enhancements. And then the magnesium two lines, uh, for example, the K line that I'm showing here exhibited this, uh, exhibited this uh, very strong blue enhancement. Now, after the kernel left the slit position, uh, uh, where this blue shift uh, occurred, uh, the lines it drew away became redshifted, uh, for example, the silicon four line, or from these pronounced red wings, uh, such as the carbon two line. Uh, I'm getting uh, back for a moment to imaging observations. Uh, and in this case, from the 304 channel of AIA uh, that imaged uh, this kernel during its slippage with slightly higher cadence. As you can see from this series of images to the left, uh, the kernel, as, as it was slipping um, between panels N and F, uh, instead of sort of following uh, a straight trajectory towards the north, it made this sort of a twist or a curl uh, as it slipped slightly towards the south at some point during its slip pitch. A comparison of, of panels C and D, uh, which uh, show uh, the location of the blue shifts uh, observed by Iris and the trajectory of the kernel, you can sort of see that uh, in terms of the direction of the slippage of the kernel, these blue shifts occurred at the leading front of the kernel during its slippage. Now, from earlier works on slipping reconnection, we know that inconsistencies or discontinuities in uh, slipping motion of kernels along ribbons are usually associated uh, with variations of the line of the magnetic field uh, uh, along the motion of the kernels. So what we did is that we adopted the positions of the kernel uh, adopted from the three or four channel observations, and we plotted them using these colored asterisks at top of the saturated HMI data, which is seen here in the panel H. What we see here is that the kernel was initially slipping through the uh, strong uh, field region of this positive polarity flux then it, approached, then it approached the PIL, uh, which is shown using the red and yellow asterisks, uh, at which uh, it entered a weak field region between this main uh, polarity uh, of the positive flux, and then, um, and then this small blob of the positive polarity yet again. Uh, from this region, the kernel accelerated and slipped rapidly uh, towards the north at speeds uh, of hundreds of kilometers per second. And uh, yet again, with plotting uh, 
the iris pixels where the blue shifts were observed, we see that the uh, blue shifts occurred when the kernel actually entered this weak field region uh, from which it accelerated. So these observations tell us that uh, there is some uh, uh, relation mm, between the slipping velocity uh, and the characteristics of heating uh, or the energy release from the chromosphere. That's two minutes left, Yuri. All right, I'm right on time. Perfect. Um, I will finish this uh, with a short discussion then. Uh, so I will just repeat that what we learned is that there is a relation between the response of the chromosphere to the heating and the velocity of the slippage of the kernels along ribbons, uh, which also points towards some ties between the characteristics of spectra and the variations of magnetic connectivity in domains. Now, blue shifts of cool lines, such as the silicon four line, are usually interpreted in terms of gentle evaporation. And it has been also the case in one or two iris observations uh, of this line. Now, uh, confirming this uh, will require some modeling, uh, which remains to be done uh, in the future, perhaps for the next paper. Uh, but I should say that uh, authors focused on numerical models of smaller heating events have already reproduced blue shifted silicon four line profiles. And in these models, usually heated, always heated by non thermal particles, uh, the particles uh, deposit their energy below the formation region of the silicon four line. This region then expands, and the silicon four uh, for formation region just like propagates upwards, uh, creating these upflows that are also short living in the models. Uh, some similar behavior was also observed for the chromospheric lines, uh, but I won't go into that right now. And I'm going to just leave the summary float here, uh, quickly saying that we have been focused on uh, slipping reconnection in an NCLAS flare. Uh, we're spectroscopically <coughs> studying uh, flare kernels, especially in the silicon four line uh, that were found of the foot point, on the foot points of the slipping flare loops. Now the silicon four line was redshifted with, four, with the pronounced red wings. However, there was a region where the Doppler shifts were uh, indicating blue shifts. Uh, and also in some cases pronounced blue wings of this line were observed. The behavior of the chromospheric lines in this very small region where the silicon four line was blue shifted was consistent uh, with that of the silicon four line. Uh, and using uh, by combining Aries observations with AI and HMI, we found that these blue shifts occurred when the kernel or the front of the kernel entered the weak field region from which it accelerated. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're ready for questions. A couple of questions if there are hands raised. Until I see one, I'll just ask uh, quickly about what your what your opin opinion is about cases where there's there are multiple simultaneous kernels and they don't seem to slip sequentially that they appear uh, at random. Is there some geometrical interpretation that you would uh, offer for that? Hmm. That's a very good question, and, and a tough I mean, one to be honest. In a sense, uh, I mean, non-sequential non motion might just mean that this that the the uh, slipping direction is just very convoluted. But it's okay. Uh, the, the thing is, uh, about what time scales are we speaking? Because I'm sure that if we looked at, for example, three or four consecutive exposures of uh, what you think are randomly appearing kernels, you would still see that they slip along the motions just for a couple of arc seconds. That's always the case. Okay. Okay, so that's very good. And uh, there is Lindsay asking a question. Hi, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Yuri, for that uh, talk. Um, so did, did I pick up correctly that the blue shifted line profiles occur in the places where the kernel is moving quickly? Did, is that what you said? Yeah, uh, yeah so I mean, uh, the problem is that uh, we would have to repeat this analysis for a lot of kernels. Yeah. And that uh, really cannot be done with uh, automatic routines. Okay. Uh, but what we see from this one case, that yes, it is true. Once the kernel enters a weak field region from which it accelerates, at that very moment when the slit of iris is pointed at the kernel, the blue shifts are observed. Now, please note that since these blue shifts are observed at very short time scales, this tells us that even if the slit of iris 
were located elsewhere in the raster and not uh, at, the, at this like front of the kernel, which is accelerating, we would have likely missed these bullshits, which is also which also might be the reason why in the whole uh, like in the whole part of the of the raft of the data set that we analyzed, this happened in one kernel only. Okay, <laughs> so you need more you need more kernels to look at, obviously. Yeah, but I'm I'm saying this cannot really be done, uh, be, in, be done automatically. So. Okay, thank you. And uh, we should probably push on to the final talk. Uh, of the conference, and that is by Tetsu Anan, Structure of the Flare Chromosphere Investigated with Magnetic Field Measurement. Hi, thank you. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity yeah, to talk our studies and, oh, sorry. Oops. <laughs> okay, and yeah, yeah today uh, I would like to present structure of the flare chromosphere investigated with magnetic field measurement. And this talk is based on master thesis Takuro Yonea Ibaraki University and our papers. First, uh, the physics of solar flare. And uh, yeah, uh, th this flow shows a uh, uh, typical energy spectra of the high energy non thermal electrons. And from it, it has a power law spectra generally. And from the solar observation, the power law index is estimated to be the larger than two. That means we need a low energy cutoff because if there is no low energy cutoff, the total number of the non thermal electron and the total energy of the non summer electron goes to infinity. And uh, these two pie charts show the two different two result, statistical results, how much magnetic energy converted to the various kind of energy. And one study says only 4% of magnetic energy goes to non summer electrons. The other is uh, yeah, half of magnetic energy go to no summer electron. So, and the, the reason why the two results are so much different is using the two different low energy cutoff. And yeah, as we discuss in yeah, interesting workshop, uh, no summer electrons penet penetrate the Chromosphere and chromosphere response to the flare. And uh, the non summer electrons stop at a certain depth depending on the, their kinetic energy and the ambient density and uh, hits the chromosphere to coronal temperature. And the light flow shows the beam heating rate as a function of the height and the corona transition region and in the chromosphere and different color show the results using the different low energy cutoff. So as you see, the depth where the non summer electron heat is strongly depends on the low energy cutoff. So diagnosis of the energy deposition in the chromosphere is essential to the, yeah, to study the energy partition in the flare process. So studying the chromosphere, flare chromosphere is very important to flare physics. And the spectral parametry is a strong tool to diagnose the flare chromosphere. Uh, but basically it's hard to interpret polarization signals uh, because a lot of process generates and modify the polarization signals. But but anyway, uh, using the some assumption, uh, there are some studies uh, reports the measurement of the magnetic field in the chromosphere in the flare. And the magnetic field in the chromosphere tend to be large in the flare chromosphere. And the light flow shows the reports the change of the magnetic field due to the flare. And the color shows the change of the magnetic field strength in the chromosphere. And here, magnetic field increase and uh, some, some parts magnetic field decrease. 
and they interpret the change of the magnetic strength as a restructuring of coronal magnetic field. And let me introduce another, another study. And they, made, they observed M class flares and they derived the line of sight component of magnitude in the chromosphere and change in time. And at flare peak, the magnetic field strength is enhanced. And they interpret the enhancement as a formation layer was deep due to the calcium to ionization. On the other hand, uh, they observe M class flare and uh, yeah, they measure a very strong magnetic field in the chromosphic line. And they also interpret the strong mass field is due to the emission was formed at a deep chromosphere uh, because of the condensation. So our aim is to diagnose complex flare chromosphere and we observe a flare ribbon using a spectral polarimetry with a chromosphic spectral line. And we obtain the information about the response of the chromosphere to the flare, especially uh, we, uh, we get got the magnetic field of multi-component. And finally, uh, we estimated the low energy cutoff of non thermal electron. And we used the Tomre Solar Telescope at his observatory in Japan. And the spectral polarimeter is based on the slit spectrograph. So we scan the slit over this active region, and we are lucky a C class flare occurs, and we successfully get the uh, Stokes spectra of the flare ribbon. Uh, the light four pro show the Stokes I and the linear polarization Q and U and circular polarization Stokes B. And the horizontal axis indicates the location on the slit and the bra this black stripe is a sunspot on the slit. And vertical axis shows the uh, wavelengths and uh, there is a chromosphere absorption line of heli neutral helium and uh, photosphere absorption line of neutral silicon. And uh, at the flare ribbon, the chromosphere absorption line turned to be the emission. And we fit the Stokes profile of the emission. Black, black diamonds show the observed profile with error bar and the red solid line show the fitting result. And we required three components to reproduce the observed profile <coughs> showing the black, black thin lines. And one of the three components is absorption. And the absorption has a magnetic field as weak as pre flare status. And the other component is a emission. And the emission has a strong magnetic field as strong as the mass field in the photosphere. It, and not only the field strength, but also the orientation of the mass field is very similar to the orientation of the mass field in the photosphere. They have a different velocity <coughs> upward and downward velocities. Again, uh, we found three components in flare chromosphere. One is absorption, the other two emission, which has a strong mass field. And generally, uh, the mass field is getting strong as the atmosphere is strong. So using the assumption, we could interpret the three components as a scheme, as like this. Absorption comes from the top chromosphere as usual in the non-flare time. And uh, two emission emitted from the deep chromosphere. To form the, this chromosphic helium line, uh, hot plasma has to be stunned by the cool chromosphic plasma. So the two emission imply as the existence of hot coronal temperature plasma in deep chromosphere. 
as you recognize the atmosphere remind us the atmosphere created by the non thermal electron penetration. So the source of the emissions can be located at the deep chromosphere right above the photosic silicon line home. And using the standard umbra atmospheric model, uh, the column density of hydrogen is estimated to be one time 10 to 20 per square centimeter at the uh, hot, hot coronal temperature plasma location. And comparing the, this numerical models, we could estimate the low energy cutoff to be the 20 keV. So I think uh, taking take away of this study is magnitude is a kind of proxy of the height where emission come from. And the Stokes profile observation and fitting allow us to uh, obtain the information multi-component and it's useful to study the complex, complex atmospheric structure. That's two minutes left, please. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's on time. And uh, let me introduce the National Science Foundation, Daniel K. Inoue Sora Telescope, the KIST, as uh, yeah, some, uh, some yeah, presenter already introduced. And uh, actually, scientific observation just begin this month. And uh, the KIST allow us to do the multi-line spectral parametry with high spatial resolution 20 to 50 kilometer on the sun, solar surface and uh, uh, using the filtergram and slit spectrograph and integral unit type spectrograph. So summary, so the low energy cut of non thermal electron is crucial for total number and total energy of the non thermal electrons. And it is important to study the energy partition of in the solar flare process. We estimated the low energy cutoff from the spectroparametric observation. Magnetic field measurement uh, has the information of height where emission come from and precise stock spectral profiles allows us to get the information multi-component and the atmosphere, the multi-component implies the atmospheric structure created by non thermal electrons. Then finally, we, we could estimate, we can estimate the low energy cutoff. In future, DKIST will reveal the more detail of the response of the chromosphere to the flare, and I hope uh, it helps us to diagnose low energy part of no thermal energy spectra. And if you know more detail, please read our papers. Thank you for listening. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you. That's very it was very interesting, and I was really impressed by the idea of a a very hot region in the very deep atmosphere. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> so actually, if uh, if Graham Kerr is on, or or Joel, or one of the Radin modelers is, is available, mm -hmm. I'd like to ask if that's possible. I mean, because if, if it's a beam model, because electrons scatter uh, very strongly, there will there will be have to be heating uh, all along the the trajectory. Mm -hmm. So, is it possible to form a hot deep layer? That's a very important uh, modeling question, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's important question to for, to model. Uh, it's possible to make uh, this kind of uh, yeah atmospheric structure. We like the cartoon anyway. That's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so no no hands uh, raised, and that question is open there. And so I think maybe it's time to pass it back to. Uh, on the organizer, we're, we're, we finished this beautiful meeting. Thank you very much to everybody. And what do you have to say then, Dato? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, that's the end of our meeting. And uh, on behalf of Hugh and Lindsay and myself, uh, we want to thank you all speakers and participants. <laughs> it was great, great pleasure to, to spend this day with you. And um, yeah, 
I think it's absolutely clear that there are lots of very interesting research on this topic uh, going on uh, in the community and uh, in, in all departments, theory, modeling, um, uh, observations in very advanced level. And I'm sure we will have more meetings. I hope at some point in-person meetings will be back, but um, now I, I want to uh, wish you all the best. Um, stay safe, take care. And before we end, I also wish you happy Christmas. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Goodbye.